Okay, there we go. All right. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another session of the Sydney Saxophone Network Q and A sessions. Uh, apologies for the hiatus. Uh, it's uh, starting to get a little bit busy down here in Sydney with a few gigs and stuff, but um, all very exciting and good. I uh, hope everyone is well out there and um, enjoying uh, some time out in the sunshine during summer. Um, this evening, we're joined by a uh, very special guest. Uh, he currently resides in Brisbane, but he is a former New South Welshman and uh, has made a significant contribution to the development of saxophone, both classical and jazz, and uh, well, thirdly as well in contemporary music uh, in Sydney and New South Wales, and of course across Australia with his uh, performances and compositions as well. And um, look, this guy has uh, so many different hats in terms of you know the performance outlets he has and what he's done. It's uh, just you know phenomenal, and you know it's almost. Um, it's almost like he's got a split personality with the d diversity in his um, uh, the gigs and uh, the things that he does. But anyway, I digress. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Martin K. Welcome, hey. Martin. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Well, Hi, Nathan. Hi. Yeah. Good to see you again. Um, so yeah, we'll be talking a lot about, um, you know, your past experiences and, you know, sharing your thoughts on music and, you know, performance and composition and stuff, but we'll just start off nice and easy. Same question I ask all the guests. Um, we're going to ask what made you pick the saxophone? What was the thing that got you started on this instrument? Uh, they had some in, in the primary school, like I grew up on the Gold Coast, so it was a government system. They came around and gave some, you know, tests in primary school that I just, uh, yeah, I did that and I said I wanted to play the trumpet. You know, my sister had already been playing the flute, so I wanted something possibly a bit louder than that. And um, yeah, but then I came home one day and there was a saxophone, a Mark VI, sitting on the living room floor. You know, I would have been 11 or something like that. Uh, I had all this lacquer on, this beautiful thing, and I thought, wow, that looks pretty complicated. Uh, but yeah, I just picked it up and yeah, just started practicing it. And it was, yeah, it turned out to be something I just, yeah, I just, yeah practiced every day without thinking about it really liked it yeah so cool. that was the beginning space at least so yeah yeah so because my dad played yeah, yeah. Right. and he okay. was sitting on his bed he was sitting under his bed for um oh i don't know how many years he joined the merchant navy you know he used to play when he was young in in the lake districts up in uh you know up in a uh, barrow in furness in the north of england and then yeah yeah Somehow it made its way to Australia when the music came around for me. So that was wow. good. Cool. Yeah. So it was quite a musical family. So like you grew up with music around everywhere or? You know, not, not particularly. Uh, you know, I think once, uh, yeah, once myself and my sister took it up, you know, through school and um, yeah, I mean, dad didn't really play, but he definitely had the knowledge to, to guide us through at first. So, uh, so yes, so he was like super keen when he was, yeah. Uh, you know, when he was an apprentice and, you know, he saved up working night shifts to buy the saxophone and stuff. So he really wanted to do it. But then he, at some point he just, you know, gave that up and did other things. And, and my mum was, um, had a musical ear, I think, but she never liked, you know, so no, not particularly musical outside of my dad. He was the one. So yeah. Okay. Mm. Nice. Um, now could you, yeah. uh, tell us about your student days on the saxophone? Um, actually I'd be sort of curious to hear about, um, cause I know you also played clarinet as well. Um, and yeah. you know, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that sort of came in early on or was that a later thing, but, um, definitely just sort of with a saxophone focus being a saxophone channel, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your sort of your early days on the instrument, uh, leading up to your maybe tertiary experiences and, you know, the people you studied with and sort of experiences that you had during those sort of crucial years in your development. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I, I formative years, I guess, if you look at through high school, which is when the main, you know, I, the, of course I played in the high school band and I played in a community big band, which is great. That was probably my main outlet. Uh, then apart from that, I just gradually went through the exam system. So, uh, the Amy B systems, Amy B systems. So I started at fourth grade and just made my way through, I think I did my Amos in grade 12. Uh, uh, and then, yeah, I, I studied, I had, yeah, my, well, my dad taught me for a while, but then he sent me to uh, Brad Millard, uh, 
up here. So he was he was very good. He saw me through my higher grades and uh, into uni. Uh, yeah, so it was pretty much yeah. I I mean right from the beginning I had a like you know interest in uh, you know the classical through the, the AMEB system and improvisation through the big band and uh, things like that. So just just hanging out um, you know in the in the pool room at my house, you know, kind of like just playing along with records and yeah hanging with my sister and stuff so it was good yeah yeah cool yeah and then um you like leading up to your uh the tertiary stuff um did you start a undergraduate degree in queensland or at sydney uh i did undergrad in queensland Queensland. okay Con. right and who was yeah. that with that was with uh dr roy thompson so okay yeah so he was um yeah Oh, he gave, he gave us a lot of freedom to kind of like pursue my own path, really. So, uh, okay. and then like there was a bit, a bit more of a, um, a, a bit more sort of, I guess, a rigorous structure because I, I mean, I was really the only saxophonist in my year. Actually, I think it was a fourth year, dude. And then there was like, um, yeah, there were a few more sax players by the time I graduated. Mm -hmm. But I was basically sitting in the clarinet. Uh, master class for most of the time so so uh and that's kind of where i probably learned the most you know because there are really some exceptional clarinetists going through so uh, yeah yeah i learned a lot from that about what was possible the levels you know so yeah and that, that's sort of what i aspire to so that and a few random records because there weren't many recordings around at that time either so yeah yeah, yeah. okay mm. and then um you you did eventually make your way to sydney um yeah. so how did how did you sort of end up down south of the border yeah well it was it was actually um i i came a long way i went via london so yeah right. uh, okay it's when, I, uh, it's when i finished my undergrad mm -hmm. i just could not you know i just wanted to leave brisbane i just i mean i was doing lots of cool stuff but like just psychologically i was just like yeah i want to see the world so yep um so I just took a year out and I just kind of uh, went and hung in London. Uh -huh. uh, just got a few uh, private lessons over there. Um, oh, wow. Borsch, uh, a couple with John Howe, um, Gerald McChrystal, just randomly, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so I was like, you know, kind of, I think 21, 22 around this time. So it's just like, and then I, in Huddersfield, it was like, oh no, Wakefield. It was a Wakefield uh, saxophone festival or something like that. Um, and I met people from Australia. So I think, I think it was Scenario Sax Quartet were there and I met Christina Leonard there. Mm -hmm. So, um, maybe John Lewis was there or maybe I met him later. Um, but yeah, I started hanging with, uh, with Christina in London, going to parties at her place. And I met lots of people from Sydney through that. Um, right. and otherwise I was just like, um, yeah, well, actually it was interesting because Christina had a, a uh, a practice studio there so she let me use that like um this is near like sort of like round jack the ripper territory you know so oh, nice. I used to go there from like what you know kind of um 10 at night to like three in the morning to practice and they just kind of do some busking and um yeah and we were you know like we were actually both working towards um going into um, some competition in uh geneva actually mm -hmm. uh, so, so practicing for that. So that was really cool to go to that while I was over there. Uh, yeah. And really, again, just here, like kind of a very high level of playing and, uh, yeah, get inspired through that. Yeah. Otherwise I was just traveling and just like, you know, yeah, sort of, yeah. Getting in a combi, traveling around Europe, which was mm. fantastic. So, you know, so, but, but when, um, when I was basically winter came around and I was getting a bit broke again and I thought I was just like cold here, I'm moving to sydney and i'll do my masters you know so i, right. I kind of like decided oh you know i know a few people from sydney now i'll head down there and yeah mm -hmm. just hang out and i was really nice you know i landed into a, an excellent community down there so and you know as opposed to, to london where it's a real struggle to meet people and like get into any sort of action you know in um yeah in sydney it was just like oh this is stuff happening i was accepted into this community straight away and it was really cool so yeah, yeah nice that's sort of yeah that's the short story yeah. okay no interesting um i, I hadn't realized that it was sort of a 
a detour via the UK to get here. So yeah, it's quite a big, de- quite a big detour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, now, just in terms of uh, just that, that your masters there in Sydney, um, like uh, it was an interesting time because you had like a lot of phenomenal people in that um, class and things like that. Um, could you maybe tell us about some of the the people who were going through uh, the con at that time with you? And also, you know, what sort of opportunities and things did you cover over there? Well, this is like, I mean, if we're talking in saxophone land, I mean, this is quite actually, I looked at that question and I went, I'm quite vague on the answer to that one. I mean, I was very much involved in the postgraduate class. So, right. okay. uh, like, you know, so like I was going to probably all I was doing really was going to lessons with, with Mark and Marjorie uh, and then going to the workshop and then the rest of the time I was pretty much just, you know, maybe a research class or an elective, but I didn't have much to do with actually the undergraduate saxophone community there. And I think I was the only, I'm, I'm happy to be corrected on this, but at that time I was the only postgrad sax player going through. So, um, yeah. So I was like kind of, yeah, you know, I mean, obviously some great people doing their postgrad, um, I was doing some, a lot of stuff with actually Jason Zampidakis. So oh, yeah. um, he was definitely there. And we were playing the Sophia Gubadalina baritone sax duet, which was really cool. So oh, yeah. yeah, and just like kind of, yeah, hooking up with, um, yeah, you know, like Chuck Clemens Lesky on piano and, and um, yeah, you know, Jane Williams on cello. And yeah, so like, yeah, so more other instruments, um, some right. percussion guy to play a percussion, right? Rather than like, so all the, like, I was hanging a lot with, um, I think, saxophone players that are already, already graduated. So, okay, gotcha. And, and, and outside, like, so I was playing when I first, actually, when I first got to Sydney, I, um, I stayed with, I don't know if you know, Elliot Dalgleish for a couple of weeks. And we started um, with Reese Archibald, Elliot Dalgleish and Tony Hobbs. And that was my first quartet that I played in, in Sydney. So, oh, wow. And we were doing like, you know, we we're doing some interesting touring. We we're just mainly doing kind of like um, Henri Pessoa, John Cage, sort of like um, some impro stuff, but like kind of contemporary classical kind of things. Um, yeah, that that kind of folded after a while. Uh, right. We did some cool stuff like, um, and yeah, and, and obviously kind of was, um, yeah, just gradually getting to know, um, yeah, uh, Jim and, um, Raf and, and Dave and Loretta and, and Mel and all of those sort of people. Narwin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just doing that, you know, very, very amounts of varying amounts of playing and partying, but like, so I was more involved with that, with that scene, gotcha. um, outside, um, rather than the saxophone community within the con at that time. Okay. Gotcha. But it was, it was still quite a vibrant scene. Like, um, the scene oh, yeah. said, there was a lot going on and you know, everyone. Heaps. Heaps. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Never a dull moment, that's for sure. Yeah. yeah cool. Um, now, um, uh, just sort of going on from that, uh, I was going to ask yeah. you, you know, have you done any additional studies overseas? But um, you sort of already answered that already. But I know you've also, you know, you've gotten some Churchill fellowship, fellowship uh, uh, sponsorship to go and study and do some additional things. So what are some other th- uh, things that you went and studied overseas or people that you might have gone to study with? Well... I was actually, um, yeah, I had a good opportunity. I, I managed to drag my master's degree out for a good four years or something like that. I did defer for a while in the middle and I was, um, part of the reason for that was, uh, I was accepted. Like I was, uh, at, that was right at the beginning of the ANAM, you know, Australian National Academy of Music. Yeah, yeah. And it was run by, it was actually structured really differently when it first started because what, what it consisted of then was like a series of two week courses. Um, right. So it's so like a short course I, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. All short courses where they pull people in from all over Australia. Uh, and, you know, so they might pull like 20 or 30 people in to hang out and do these short courses in intensives. And it was really great. Um, and I was, fortunate enough I got accepted in as a core member uh which basically meant I could tick the box on anything I wanted to go to uh so I kind of um I one of the things I went to was like a a two-week intensive on stockhausen right with um with people from uh Dietmar Weisner 
and uh, Kathy Milliken from Ensemble Modern, and they came out to Australia and they were just like working on Infra and Shaft with us. And like, you know, I was kind of like sitting cross-legged on podiums, you know, like with seashells and, you know, water and, you know, playing like yeah. bass saxophone and electroacoustic stuff. And, um, and yeah, I don't know, I spent an extraordinary time, amount of time on, on Infra and Shaft actually um, with all the movements and from memory, that was so cool. Um, wow. And then, so that was like where the international kind of like scene actually came to Australia, right? Okay. And also there was a woodwind one at the time, which was held in Sydney, um, and Kyle Porsche came out for that. So that mm -hmm. was really good. Uh, so he spent a week with us. And yeah, I really always get a lot out of Kyle's teaching. So, and um, and what else? You know, there was a, like a two week jazz intensive, which I went to. So I kind of like met all the people from all the centers. And then another one was where, um, in Brisbane, actually, for two weeks or something, there was like an international festival up here, and a part of that was uh, debuting, uh, premiering Thomas Ada's uh, Powder Her Face opera. Right? So, uh, so I did that with Barry Croftoff came up for that one too. So, so that's like you know, there's lots of opportunities for that, and and the um, yeah, and and the final thing, like the final benefit for, of that one was uh, actually I got. Um, you know, I could apply for like a scholarship to go um, for some international study. You know? So I, I, um, I had been wanting to go to New York forever and ever. So I kind of like, yeah, I got some money to do that. I went to New York for three months uh, and then, oh, three, sorry, three weeks that time. Uh, and then, yeah, got some, you know, I just sort of go out and listen to people play and, you know, ask them for lessons, you know, like. Mm -hmm. Like there was a guy, um, actually a Dutch guy, Mark Lamas. Uh, he he'd been over there and he'd been getting le lessons with all the all the dudes. And he was a really beautiful player. But he uh, he was particularly good because he kind of like he just saw me and just went, ah, okay, yep. And he kind of like in a way, like in one hour, he just, he deconstructed my whole um, approach to impro and chords and jazz, right? But in wow. in a good way, just like you know, and also like. Um, yeah, you know, it's, and yeah, so he gave me like a good couple of years of things to think about. So he showed me the gaps, right? Mm -hmm. So more that Berkeley system, like it's like it's a full, a full system. Uh, whereas like I'd kind of put it together in quite a patchwork way um, from, you know, however records and just experimenting trial and error. Right? Yeah, yeah. But um, so that was good. And yeah, a few other things. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things I got out of, New York that first time was sort of seen as like this kind of intense manic city, but uh, all the players there, they're just like, they're into this like attitude of relaxation. They're just like, you know, just chill out, just relax, man. you know, like you got to do that for the music to come through. And, and yeah, I found that really, yeah, really interesting because they see that as intrinsic to the music and the way it feels and, and the way everyone interacts with each other. So which is interesting for such a competitive kind of cutthroat scene, you know? Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, it's sort of like kind of like hovering above all of that in a way. Yeah. Right. Um, and then I went to, after that, I went to hang with um, with Barry because he was studying in uh, in Bordeaux at that time. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah, so I just kind of like um, <laughs> stayed at, um, yeah, uh, Murray Bay's house, uh, where, where Barry was, where he was re recording with his quartet at the time. Um, amazing quartet. And so I was just, yeah, basically it was kind of an observation tour there. I was just like drinking wine and hanging out and did some, um, did some good busking with Barry there actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ended up like, I, I, I remember leaving at like four in the morning to get a train and I took his saxophone and somehow we got, yeah, wow. <laughs> and left mine there. Yeah. <laughs> so. But um, yeah, that, that was fun, you know? Um, and then, yeah, you know, yeah, a little uh, a li a little cheeky trip to India on the way home. And then, uh, yeah, nice. so that was, yeah. So, you know, I've got a nice dose of sort of, you know, it's like a lot of really nice opportunities in that time, you know, while I was yeah, doing yeah. my, my master's spread out over four years or whatever. Yeah. Wow. And then after that, that's when I got the Churchill, right? So like I kind yeah. of always dovetailed that, right? So yeah. like, it's like I graduated um, in 2000 and then I got the, um, yeah, got the Churchill, which was great. You know, it's sort of like one of the easiest applications I've ever done. You know, it's like, just like a little one or two page thing, 
then there's like kind of like quite a heavy panel of four people or something and they're just like you know like you know, I, I decided after my first experience in new york i wanted to go back and do my church all there you know study more do that um and, and yeah you know, like you, you don't you think jazz is dead you know and like you know they're just trying to work you over but it was actually yeah. kind of like it was it was like kind of like yeah i was I, what, what do you say i was like I, I hadn't had a lot of sleep and i i kind of went on some some good rants and they gave it to me and it went well and nice. I ended up going back back to new york in the uh in the wonderful year of 2001 so that oh, was good yeah right. yeah that was a good one yeah yeah Okay. But yeah, um, and then, and then, you know, so yeah, I mean, sorry, that's like a long, a long-winded answer, kind of like uh -huh. lessons. But I basically, I've gotten lots of, um, lots of lessons off lots of different people while traveling. But generally, only one or two, you know. It's, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's like just picking up, you know, small sport. Yeah. yeah. No, it sounds so. fascinating. Um, so sort of continuing on with that. Um, uh, this might be a little tricky because, as you say, you sort of had a smorgasbord of you know, uh, people you've gotten lessons off, but were there any particular lessons or um, uh, sort of one-to-one -one lesson experiences that you had um, that stick out in your mind? And if so, why are they memorable or why do they stick with you to this day? Um, yeah, I mean, I think we've already talked about one with Mark Mamas, who just like kind of like, you know, just sees through. And um, uh, yeah, Marjorie Smith was very good in that way. Like, because she just like, I remember like learning the Chelsea uh, with her and she just made me play it in time. That one's really good. Something so simple, right? Mm. Um, because it's like, okay, yeah, you're right. I'm just guessing, <laughs> you know? <laughs> um, but like, yeah, like very convincingly so, but like, it's just like, no, you, you know, go back, go back to what's on the score and just figure it out, you know? So like, I like, I think, I think in some ways that, um, yeah, I like that kind of, that more rational kind of like approach is good mm -hmm. uh, to me, like was good for lessons. So, but, um, but in, yeah, in general, you know, like, yeah, there was no, just, just, just interesting things here or there, you know, George Gartzone was really interesting to study with, okay. you know, like he's got this like standard kind of triadic method he works yeah. with, that he kind of like inside out approach uh, going, you know, yeah. And that's, uh, I mean, that was more hilarious for like, kind of like how I'd screw up his instructions, you know, <laughs> you're going, yeah, man, just like, just kind of like, yeah, do your, um, yeah, you can just do your triads in, in, in any inversions and in any order. And, you know, and, and then I'd kind of like start doing it. No, not like that. There's got to be some key setup, but like, okay. So that showed me you didn't play anything. Right. And he's always thinking of a key center, you know, because mm -hmm. like, you know, and, and, and that there's actually a whole, a whole like, um, world of submerged thought and, and experience that goes behind this simple concept that he kind of like, well, how should I say he, he wheels out and he's done very well internationally with this one simple concept. Right. Yeah. But like, yeah, but he kind of like, yeah, he got, he got to there in a lot of different ways. You know? So, but anyway, so yeah, like, um, lot, like, like again, like some of the players I went to in New York, you know, like the ones that I went up to and, Hey, can I get a lesson? You know, we played together. Like, uh, Tim Burr was interesting because he would just be like, I think that went for half an hour before his Italian tour started to collapse. And he just said, Hey, you know, there's two people I like playing with, uh, like, well, yeah, I either like playing with someone or I don't. And yeah, I like playing with you. See you later. I've got to go on tour, you know, <laughs> but it's, <Right>. um, <laughs> so a lot of them, yeah, you know, it's, um, I, no, I definitely, I've never had a lesson where I haven't, haven't gotten something positive or, you know, negative out of it, <laughs> but it's like, <laughs> but it's all learning. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. But, all right. You know, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Cool. And, um, and, so, um, just talking about, uh, you yourself as a player now um as i said at the start you you have an interest in you know a vast array of different musical genres and styles and um you know you you delve into all those styles with you know equal amount of passion and enthusiasm and yeah just extraordinary how you how you're able to juggle that but in terms of just yourself and your biggest musical influences who do you who are the the people that resonate most to you musically and why um do they resonate with you 
Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you know, like, um, probably, a, like, there's, I, I know the people that, like, when I've listened to them, and they've given, like, like, have been quite influential, right? So when I uh, first heard Claude de Long play, for instance, his solo saxophone, and I was mm -hmm. like, that came at a good time for me, because I was not aware of that repertoire, you know, like, say, this is, like, kind of, like, I'm I'm a slow adopter with technology, really at the best of times. But you know, this was still early, and the internet was in its infancy. So I was like, kind of hard, you know. I wasn't really around a lot of um, stuff, so I heard this, and I was like, a there was this super interesting repertoire, and and b it was like, it was so superbly played, right? Mm. And earlier, like you know, like um, like hearing just a random tape that some random like teacher just came in from the next room at Marcel Mule and and gave me, uh, you know, it's, uh, one of his uh, etudes. And, and I just had to listen to it once and I went, wow, that's possible, my God. And that's just enough for me, you know, mm -hmm. to go, I want to be able to do that, right? Um, so, so that influenced me to actually kind of come back to, you know, like it gave me my focus to, to study in Sydney, you know, like to begin with like these works, the Chelsea's and the Stockhausen's, you know? Uh, the Joel ass and all of that and sort of like look into that stuff mm. um yeah so and um yeah the what it, and there's um arno had a sonato a, a sonata and piano cd with um which like yeah it was really great to listen to when i was in my undergrad and that was just like just you know just the way he played was just like yes that's good i want to you know like want to reach that level and play those things and kyle Walsh had that as well when i hear him play um and then okay so there's that and, and i'd say that like probably um a massive influence like um in when i was in my fourth year undergrad um i had a big shift because i um decided to do my uh my honors thesis on eric dolphy um nice. and there wasn't much around so um but i ordered these beautiful handwritten transcriptions from the states and um and through that, I really got into, um, you know, uh, Coltrane was huge for me at that time. Um, and Ornette Coleman, you know, just like these open forms that they are exploring really. Um, and just like, just the, um, I guess the timbres, just what they were doing with the saxophone. was just like, okay, that's cool. Like, you know, I'll be able to do that. Um, something like that, right? Uh, and, and apart from these like major famous influences, I, I think just like, um, yeah, it's been very much tempered um, by, yeah, the, the situations I put myself with people surrounding me, you know, mm -hmm. and they've been probably really hugely influential. So on, um, I guess, yeah, that's <laughs> making my playing functional. Let's put it that way. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, because it can get pretty random when you're like, yeah, you, yeah, you're just playing in a room by yourself a lot right yeah, um, yeah and then you kind of like you know then to kind of like yeah so it's really nice i think it's been yeah so there's been these other like more subtle influences of everyone i've played with that i've had to kind of like yeah make music with so mm. yeah which is sort of like yeah the bridge from yeah the imagination to, to earth or whatever you know yeah, yeah. yeah. well you know as i say mm. it's always more fun playing with others than yourself so yeah Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, all right, cool. Now, um, your, as I said, your career um, is uh, still going, of course, but it's, um, you know, you've, you've had um, a vast array of opportunities. Um, uh, and I believe there's a lot of opportunities that um, it was sort of like you, you pursued some things yourself in terms of uh, finding gigs and stuff, but you also have been uh, asked to do some bits and pieces as well. Can you tell us a bit about yeah. some of the, the, the opportunities that you've created for yourself, maybe some of the projects that um, you've instigated? Yeah, sure. Um... Yeah, I mean, in terms of like, I, I think uh, compositionally, that's what like, you know, this might be jumping ahead a bit, but this is what, okay. like, in a way, why I, I started developing my compositional style was so I could actually um, get people together and frame them in a way and draw them together 
um, and at the same time just explore things I was interested in. So rather than go, oh, hey, um, you know, let's get together for, um, let's just get together for a jab or, or, you know, or let's get through, let's read through some duets or some chamber music and it doesn't go anywhere to have like a specific kind of thing I'm exploring, you know, and that that's like, so Soul Fla is, is a big one for that, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and actually we did just like that, <laughs> having said that, I had a backpedal and say, we just, Jamie and Dave and I, we just did get together and just do some playing, right? And we yeah. were just playing free. But then gradually, like, I would go, okay, you know, we really developed, started to develop a, a rapport and, and a language. And then I started to kind of bring in compositions over the top of that to frame it and guide it. And, yeah. Um, and, and quite often these were, um, I've got this interest in, say, juxtaposing, like, like really thought out through composed things with free improvisation and kind of like almost like so you like somehow you can't quite tell what's what a lot of the time and that was one of my aims with song far and it was a real challenge because we preserved you know there was no bass stage i just played the h string guitar whatever so uh it, it evolved my composing like it changed it because i had to write it for that those limitations yeah, so, yeah. so that's yeah and then and then actually this has grown quite nicely because um i well actually this is another uh, another um cool thing i did a couple of years ago i Mm -hmm. I attended the international jazz and um, creative music intensive in banff in canada Mm -hmm. uh, which is curated by um, vijay ayer Uh, and it's just like extraordinary kind of musicians there just like thrown in together like it's a real eclectic mix but i decided you know that the best way i was going to deal with this was to arrange song flower charts you know like orchestrate them so uh, so i did that and that went really well and and i was yeah i was very pleased um at the response to things like the getty's goat and whatever and mm-hmm. and then um yeah so i decided to arrange a whole lot more so that, and that's led to forage my current group uh which i'm running in brisbane so um and it's good you know because like you you know you kind of you, you rock up in town and you can just say you got this like you know you got, you've got this book of stuff you can kind of like just invite people along get them to hang out and read so it's really nice yeah so yeah that's probably um two two of the things that, that stick in mind uh, mm-hmm. Now, continuum sax, which we'll probably get into, you know, yeah. obviously I had a, I had a um, yeah, I, I I don't know if, I, I definitely co-founded it. I don't, pretty sure I didn't instigate that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I have, even in a way, I, I always loved playing saxophone quartets. You know? yeah. So I've always played it, like actually from my first year of undergrad unit, I've uni, always played in a quartet. So, yeah. But I mean, that's sort of like, yeah, at different times, I would kind of like, with, with that group, I would go, oh hang on yeah and, you know so i've taken the initiative and that generally takes the form of, of writing something right mm. so yeah yeah okay no it's so, all very cool um yeah. uh now just sort of going in line with that um i mean as i say like you've um you have instigated a few things and um you know created some opportunities and uh ensembles like song for our and for age and um in in terms of like if you were to advise a younger musician who's maybe you know recently graduated and looking to try and you know make it into the scene and you know uh, you know trying to you know build a career in terms of you know finding their own opportunities what from your experiences that you've had and you know the the things that you've sort of been through and the trials and errors and all that stuff what what kind of advice could you give to a younger musician looking to you know start off their career and build opportunities is it you know a matter of networking is it a matter of you know going having a hang at the pub or you know going to concerts or like what what do you think it is yeah i mean i think it's all of those things but i think it's sort of like it's got to be a fairly organic process as well i guess it, i guess it's um personality dependent you know i like i found you know the art of musician whispering or whatever you know it's like <laughs> And all that means is like some of the um, some of the one of the best pieces of advice I got from, from actually Brad Millard when like I was going to undergrad con and, and he said you know like if you hear someone's playing in a room and you like it tell them open the door 
you know? And that's led to a lot of stuff, just saying, hey, you know, like I met Sam Golding from Monthly Like That, for instance. I just went, and it was like, but genuinely, it was the most beautiful, uh, you know, trumpet sound. And I just felt compelled to go and say, that is beautiful, you know? And um, yeah, you just get chatting and then nothing may come of it initially. But, you know, like a couple of years later, he calls up and says, oh, you know, you want to play clarinet and monk? I'm like, hey, cool, right? Um, yeah, so so networking, but in a kind of a, you know, like it's, I don't know, it's got to be organic and genuine. I mean, I mean, there's lots of people always out and about. Yeah, go out, just hang out, chat with people. Yeah. yeah. And then you've got to play with them, of course, right? And yeah. That's why it's like important. That's why you've got to kind of go out and, you know, when you see someone's playing, you hear someone's playing, you know, you think you want to do something with them, you know, like, yeah, have something in mind and give them a call and probably say yes, you know? Yeah. So I think that's it, like, you know, like that real grassroots kind of a thing. You know? so, yeah. Um, yeah. I've never, I don't know, I've never really approached it in, in any other way. So, mm. yeah. That's nice. That's good. You know, I mean, like, you know all about that with, with Nexus, right? It's just it's organic growth, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just sort of you randomly ish. work with someone or, you know, you happen to know someone, you get chatting, and the next thing you know, you're on stage together doing something. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, 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 yeah. But you got to be, I mean, I think though, it's like, um, it does involve perhaps getting outside the comfort zone, uh, comfort zone socially sometimes, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, I, I know the times when I've gone, you know, I, I've done it the most, you know, where I, I, I've needed to do it the most is like, uh, you know, see when I first moved to a town, right? You've got no choice. You've got to go out and you, you know, yeah. you've got to show yourself and you've got to kind of chat, and, you know? Yeah um yeah and then and then as you kind of become yeah uh you you know a lot of people you tend to do it less right but it's like i i think that thing can do with constant refresh you know in, in one's career as well right so yeah yeah so yeah let people know you're still you know out there and doing things and stuff you know i'll just find you people to play with every now and then yeah you know yeah that's right yeah so to say, hey, you know what else is going on? Because it's nice playing with the same people all the time. And I like that's how I've kind of, in a way, uh, pursued my career. Just like long, like kind of long running ensembles with the same people. And that's just like a real, yeah, I love doing that. But mm. it's, yeah, it's good to get out. Like, again, it's, it's getting out of the comfort zone and like how do you grow artistically? And I think that's good to see it get out with, you know, getting yeah. other people and other things as well. And I, I learn a lot from doing that too about, yeah about how to communicate my music to people and say, you know, or, yeah. Yeah. No, you that, know, that, communi that's... communicating too much. So they kind of like, they're like <laughs> rabbits in headlights, uh, you know, and then, or, yeah, and then just sort of going, yeah. So like, you know, for instance, we, we're forage at the moment, you know, like, like I get all the charts and then it's kind of like, you know, I've learned like a lot through rehearsing ensembles and about efficient rehearsal techniques and et cetera. And quite often it's just about saying nothing. You know, so I, I, you know, you, you 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 play with the musicians you trust, you know, and you bring them in, and, and yeah, 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 and then and then uh, yeah, you let their voices take hold and and, and take it all somewhere, um, yeah. So I think that's something I've learned like a, lo a lot, you know. On occasion, mm -hmm. I've tried to uh, push my agenda, and it hasn't worked, you know. And I'm much more happier now just to kind of like let it all roll. So yeah, that's yeah. I mean, that's the beauty of it, yeah. Yeah, no, there's, some, there's something very valid with that. Like, um, uh, you, it's certainly easy, like, you know, you get caught up, um, you know, playing with people and, you know, it can often be the same people for, you know, years and years and years. And, um, you know, just sort of having, finding some other experiences outside as well, just to sort of, um, it, not necessarily, you know, replace that, but just sort of to, you know, find something different and it gives you different insights, different approaches. And as you say, just sort of, you know, gives you a bit of a, uh, a different perspective on things that you may not have thought of before. And it's like an ever evolving process, I guess. Yeah. And it's just good for the reflexes and good for the mind, you know, playing with different people all the time because everyone's, you know, yeah. Like people's senses of time are slight different, you know, like yep. you just develop a, you know, a more complex range of community responses and, and, and hence your know, musical responses. And yeah. yeah. So I think it's just all, yeah. Because sometimes, uh, artistic development can seem really, really incremental. Mm. You just seem like you're going backwards, you know? So I think that's one way that, yeah, uh, I find 
um, I can push it in a different way as well. So, cool. Yeah. Um, now, speaking of um, playing with uh, people for you know, long stints of time, uh, I'd like to talk about um, going back to your, your days in Continuum, uh, which you're still oh, yeah. a, me a member of now. Um, now, I've interviewed yeah. a few... Um, I just talk a bit about the ensemble itself. I have interviewed a few members past and present. Um, so it'd be interesting yeah. to see your take on this, on this side of things. But um, how did this group Continuum Sax come about from your perspective? Yeah, it's so, it's so vague for me, actually. Yeah, I remember being asked, like I remember standing at reception and I, I yeah. Maybe was it, it was, I can't even remember. Was it Marjorie that asked me? But see, well, I have this thing. I, yeah. According, according to Marge, yeah, it was you and Marge, and I think you asked Jim and Jared back in the day. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's that's kind of my memory that that yeah, um, yeah, because like I say I was getting some lessons off Marge and we're hanging a bit, and mm -hmm. yeah, she wanted to start this quartet, and I was like really excited. I'm like, oh, that's really cool, you know. Um, yeah, but I know there's different different versions around because people are playing with different quartets. So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. I would concur with that version of it. Okay, no worries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that's cool. Yeah. Now, um, the, uh, the one. It... Oh, sorry, I missed that, Marty. No, no, it's 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 all right. It's very, Okay, yeah. <laughs> all right. All it's right. in the midst of time. Yeah. It's, all right, uh... the moment's passed. No worries. Yeah. Um, <laughs> All right, now the um, one of the fascinating things about a continuum, um, like me being a young student, impressionable student at the time, you know, seeing a continuum out there performing, it was something that was like, wow, it's amazing. We've got this great saxophone quartet there, and um, not only was it a, a, a fantastic, you know, a chamber group, but you also were huge advocates of promoting and commissioning new Australian music, and the output yeah. that you guys had was tremendous in terms of, um, you know, pushing. Um, the development of Australian uh, saxophone quartet repertoire, not only by commissioning other composers, but also, you know, writing in-house. Um, yeah. In terms of just that artistic focus, uh, focus of the group, was that always the case? Like that was always the sort of the musical um, uh, MO for Continuum? I, I just think it's, uh, it just all happened quite naturally. So, because we just, um, you know, just, we definitely didn't want to go the way of uh, of doing, you know, we'd all done the, the French standard repertoire through uni. And I know Marge definitely, I think Marge was a big driver in that because she was interested in composition herself. So she mm -hmm. saw it as a vehicle. Um, we just knew a lot of composers as well. So it just made sense. Uh, and, I, and I just think, you know, we can see how it's uh, just culturally just a part of, uh, of saxophone playing. You know, it's just like, like it's almost like, Kind of creating new repertoire is just a part of the part of the thing right so it's a way to kind of like create a niche for yourself um carve out a territory is like to create this original repertoire uh and at the same time it's like um yeah, you're just developing these interesting relationships with composers which you know often leads to other things you know it tentacles out into the the wider community and different scenes so you know, and they're learning about saxophone. They've got a good group to write for, and and yeah, we got something to play. So it just felt like yeah, it was just a, a natural way to go. So, nice. Yeah. Um, now mm. you have sort of touched on it, but just the the commissioning process um, uh, and uh, sort of you know a, approaching these composers, like as you said, you sort of you know uh -huh. they'd either hear you and go, oh, you know, I want to write for you guys, or you said you knew a lot of composers, and was it just a matter of just asking for them or was it, uh, is it a little bit more of a interesting story there or in, in some of the compositions? No, 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 no. I mean, I, I know that uh, Jim did drive a bit of that um, in, 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 you know, in the background. He'd go, oh, yeah, yeah you know, you'd always have, uh, you know, some composer, um, yeah, you know, someone interested. So he's kind of like, yeah, he was good at, good at chatting about that um, and organising those things. Mm -hmm. Some of it was involved with, with grants. Uh, not many, uh, mainly it's just done, yeah, kind of gratis, or some of it was done through Music of Viva, for instance, you know, we'd have opportunities there. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but, but you know, I mean, probably the simple answer is yes, just ask. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I think, and that's probably, um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the easiest way, you know? So, yeah. I'm not sure if any, like which composers approached us, you know, they may, may have been some that were putting in grants and stuff, but um, yeah, 
I'm not I'm I'm not not down into those gritty details actually. So, oh, okay. Yeah, I was there for rehearsals and come along and you know read through stuff. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, fair enough. Um, no, yeah. I say tenor parts too easy. Give me some more. <laughs> Yeah, I know some yeah. of the tenor parts are quite diabolical um, for the works that you've had commissioned. So, um, yeah, thanks for that. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now, uh, I, I do believe there's probably one composer that you could talk about, and this is actually yourself. Um, you being one of the, the in-house composers. Um, in the early days, it was uh, you and Marge, and now I believe it's you and uh, uh, is Nick, I believe, still starting? Yeah. Out? Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I don't think I've played one of his quartets yet, 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 though, so I'm looking forward to that. Okay, but yeah. definitely on the cards. So, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Um, so in terms, <laughs> in terms of being, you know, one of the in-house composers, um, like, how how would you... Um, it, it's an interesting sort of conundrum because you've got to perform it and then you've also got to write it. Well, sorry, the other way around. You've got to compose it first, then you have to perform it, but... Like, yeah. you would tailor your pieces to the ensemble, right? Like, I know you had your little suite, um, you know, you'd have your... Yeah, your... I wanted to write a feature for each instrument. I thought yeah. that was like, kind of like just a nice way to structure something. Uh, yeah. And actually, those, I, I was trying to learn how to write melodies, basically. I'm like, okay, okay you know, write a melody. So I was like, um, so I had been experimenting with a few melodies um, for... Uh, for another group, you know, or, or you know, like, like you know, like we, we've sort of already chatted about, like, it's just a way I can bring someone, go, hey, come around and play. I've got a couple of tunes. Can we just read through them, see what they're like, right? And the, and yeah, these things were working out all right. So I decided just to kind of like, um, yeah, just flesh them out a bit more. Sit down at the piano, flesh them out, you know, and then yeah, give your, give everyone a feature. So yeah, with slightly comedic titles, which was good, you know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I believe it. But um, oh, sorry, I was just going to say, yeah. I believe a couple of the titles you had, um, "Tis Raining Jim" and uh, "Jared Drives the Bus" and the "Last Tango of Yeah," and "Poco Loco March" right. and things like that. Yeah, yeah, quite silly. It was good. Yeah. It was fun. It was great. And, I, and, I, and I was pretty happy with you know I was pretty happy with the response because I was thinking, oh well, you know, this is kind of like I almost see oh, they're kind of like you know they they like I thought of them as almost simple little kind of like just ditties you know like mm. in a way just like straight out melodies and orchestrations and um, yeah but they worked out really well and again encouraged me to, to do some more so I, yeah. I you know I've written I've written a few things that that um, yeah I've, it's great to have that forum basically because I've definitely written a few things that didn't work. Um, but you know that's all really, really valuable to know. You know, invaluable, whatever the word is. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, yeah. Like all. <laughs> but, but I mean, I think I think my favorite, um, my favorite one I've written for Continuum is the Betty Boot. So, yeah, I was going to uh, ask about uh, that one. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, can, can you tell us about um, that because it was um, it, it different again in terms of the the concept of it, and maybe just talk about how like what was in your mind when you were writing for Continuum for that. Yeah, I just wanted to, obviously, I wanted to write something with image, right? That was yeah. the starting point. Um, and I wanted to explore the concept of Mickey Mousing, which is like kind of mocking absolutely every gesture on the screen, being really over the top. And, I, and, I, and, and this kind of like, in a way, freed me to write quite intuitively, uh, mm -hmm. which I like, rather than kind of like conceptually... Uh, you know, bashing my head about like, ah, oh, this rhythm and let's, how do we develop this and this develop? I kind of sing something and write it, right? And I was really actually into uh, developing, uh, you know, Finale as like a tool where I could just like write super quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Before the idea got lost or whatever, you know? Yeah, That's yeah. A, always a challenge with notation programs. It takes so long to get something down or whatever or write it down that it's lost, you know? So how to do it super quick. Um, yeah, and, and and I mean, there are a whole lot of technical issues to solve. I did it with Pro Tools, um, so I kind of like I, I what did I do? I put a whole lot of markers in, and then I took it to Pro Tools. I took the Finale file into Pro Tools, and then I orchestrated it on no Logic. Sorry, was it? my God? I think it was Logic. I took it okay. into Logic and I orchestrated it in Logic. I bought Logic for that reason. Yeah, um, yeah, all the synths and everything like that. Um, 
Yeah, and it just worked out really well. I mean, actually, the recording of it sounds much better because Scott Christie undid all my awful auto edit editing, you know? Wow. And made it sound clear. <laughs> Apparently, he spent ages on it. And I don't know, I like to get that file off him because when, when we did it live, it was really hard to hear the details. So mm -hmm. I'd almost have to kind of like, to perform it live again, I'd almost have to kind of redo it, I reckon. Oh, <laughs> so it might just be a standalone. I might just be that, you know? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I really enjoyed it, and I love listening back to it. I didn't record on that. I was, I was away at the time, so someone did my part for me. Do you okay. like thing? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. I, I, I remember being at the premiere of that, and that was definitely a, um, a, a really an enjoyable concert and a great piece. And, yeah, it's certainly, you know, one of the highlight continuum concerts for me um that oh, cool. experience yeah. so yeah um yeah i love drawing too yeah yeah no, yeah cool now um the uh, speaking of concert highlights with continuum do you have a, a, a particular concert that is a, a personal favorite for you and if so why no 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 <laughs> <laughs> they're all good yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, some I enjoyed more than others. I mean, you know, we've had a lot of amazing um, gigs, you know, like um, we did Fearful Symmetries with the Opera Ballet. That was really cool. Just going in every night and playing that. Uh, John mm -hmm. Adams is great. Uh, um, yeah, we've done a lot of really cool collaborations, you know, like um, yeah. Plucked Out Duo. That was a really fun collaboration. And, you know, mm -hmm. listen back to that stuff and go, that was, yeah, that was really cool really great um yeah there was a thing called the six pack symphony in brisbane with like lots of groups together like um yeah i think it was like um topology brodsky quartet um us um wood this kind of western australian group anyway it was just came together as a big orchestra and a member from each group wrote something so cool um so yeah there's been lots of lots of really fun things you know and we're like kind of yeah or always always hanging out together playing you know like probably a few different riffs or stuff like that with the sydney simp so it's like mm. yeah we've had a lot of fun but i like i think i like um i always like touring you know like it's painful and it takes a lot of organization but there's something really special about hitting the road with a group that's fun so, yeah 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 Hmm. It's, I think it's epic. Epic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it can get pretty epic, particularly uh, <laughs> the post uh, beer gig, uh, post gig beers. I think can also get a bit epic on some of those. But anyway, uh, they're all yeah. Good. Um, it's another, another chat, another yeah. chat for another time. Uh, <laughs> now, um, you uh, just sort of talking about um, some of your other projects. Now we have talked about uh, things like. Songfla and Forage, Forage. Ah, sorry, my um, Sydney accents kicking. Forage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, must be all that time in Bondi. I don't know. Um, anyway, sorry, Bondi people. Anyway, um, yeah, just sort of talking about these groups. Now, these are sort of your your projects uh, that you talked about initially, and um, maybe you can sort of talk a little bit about the the general sort of um, musical direction uh, for a couple of these projects. So, for instance, we'll start with Songfla. So that's uh, you. Dave Reeston and Jamie uh, Cameron. Yeah. Um, well, I think we, we we kind of alluded to that before. You yes. know, I would say like we just got together just to play free, um, and then gradually the compositions came into it. I think we decided, yeah, we want to make it a thing. We want to record an album. So I think the album was a real driver. And then we was actually it was really great because we rehearsed every week. Um, you know, I'd bring a tune in. Sometimes I would revise a tune three or four times, you know, because I just couldn't quite, you know, mm -hmm. couldn't quite get it right or whatever, or, you know, something had happened and I'd suggest it, you know. Um, so, and again, like, so that was my musical direction where I was sort of like writing these, bringing in these, um, say something like Pedestrians of Steel or Ligeti's Goat, these, like I was into writing absolutely epic, like long form tunes like based on tone rows, um, but then juxtaposed with wild free improvisation. So, and then genre shifts, you know, like, mm. um, you know, like going to reggae and then, and then like, like some death metal and then just some like kind of polyrhythmic kind of seven over four thing, or just like, uh, so that's what I was really exploring, you know, and I was sort of like developing these kind of, uh, stories over them as well, which kind of like had a feedback loop with the actual, 
him. So, okay. um, and then Dave was bringing his part in, which had a totally different character again. So, yeah, which had his peculiar, you know, particular uh, sense of humour. Uh, yeah, he's he's a quirky dude. He is, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I mean, that's the direction, you know. I I think, um, you know, it's a classic. Uh, locus around albums, you know, We've got these two albums, which, you know, I'm really, really pleased with. And um, around that, we did a lot of touring and in some local gigs. So, uh, yeah. So that was like the direction of that sort of like, so like highly improvised, but experimental, like really experimental with forms, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. What other groups are there? Ah, uh, yes. well, Munkle, we... yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think I said, you know, I, like Sam Golding invited me yeah. to Munkle. Um, uh, and I, I, I like Munkle because, like, it taught me a lot of different things as well. Like, it was probably, it probably still remains to this day one of the most inefficient rehearsal bands I've ever played in, but really? in the best way. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that surprised you. It's just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, so so for um, you know, for me, like who would um, yeah, it was used to kind of like these saxophone quartet rehearsals, and like you know, whenever you rehearse, it was always like, hey, let's just like you know, let's work now or kind of play later kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, with Muggle, it's just like pretty much three hours of just like chatting and wordplay with an occasional tune. Right. You know. <laughs> okay. which was actually like i grew to love it i'm like okay i really like this so i can see the benefits of this you know yeah, yeah, yeah. and and those guys have that i don't write for that group um but it, uh, but I, it was the sole reason for me getting the clarinet out after not touching it for about 10 years mm. um and actually kind of trying to drag it up to a level uh yeah <laughs> trying to yeah trying to learn yeah trying to learn how to improvise on it you know like without you know because the, the the 12th thing used to, you know it still blows my mind oh you know, yeah yeah it's, it's very like, easy to go back to the sax man so, fingerings yeah way easy so um but anyway yeah so so and, and, and actually changed my my aesthetic as well playing mm -hmm. with that well it, well it didn't change it it just added a whole nother dimension to uh yeah my artistic aesthetic where i uh, I kind of like just saw how people loved these quirky tunes and these sort of like weird, like short form things. And yeah, I started to explore that myself, which is, yeah. Cool. So, yeah. Yeah, nice. And that's yeah. like, you know, like, it's all kind of like, um, you know, because Danny, Danny was in, he's in what well, used to be in, in Mr. Bungle and all of that. And those guys love that sort of art mm. pop scene and, and so I uh, also like a lot of spaghetti Western stuff. So it was like, that was pretty fun. Still is fun. We will, uh, yeah, we did a lockdown recording. So we'll, oh, we'll cool. be back on, yeah, back on track at some point. So nice. Yeah. And what about your, mm. your latest, uh, your project in Brisbane? Um, I'm giving up pronouncing it cause I'm just going to forage. That's yeah. Tricky. Forage. Yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, basically, uh, yeah, well, it's, Focusing on the epic things that I did with uh, with uh, Song Kwa, right? Mm -hmm. But it's like it, it, it has well, it has had um, two double basses. That that's the, the group, right? So, but a double bass who plays um, like with all his pedals and electrics. So he's kind of like, yeah, he's great. And then there's the more straight ahead double bass. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, drums, keys, and then just front line of tenor, alto, and trombone. So cool. Uh, that's great, but I mean, now the uh, the it, it sort of was on ice. We we actually did a gig a few weeks ago, but now the bass player and the, and the tennis sax player they've continued on moving through. So, you know, oh, okay. Helen's kind of yeah, she's got the um, they moved to Melbourne actually. Um, Helen's the uh, artist in residence with the art orchestra this year, as well as uh, won the Friedman Fellowship. So she's just kind of like totally nailing it. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's great to have her in the group for a while. Um. Yeah, so I'm looking to, like for a total uh, reset and refresh on that. I think all of the all of that material, I think it's going to be there, but I think I need to just, yeah, I need to write a whole new batch of stuff. Right. So, time, I think. Yeah. yeah. Watch this space. Reset button. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice one. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, uh, uh, 
would also, I mean, you've done so many different things. Like, you know, you've, uh, you know, you played so many solo gigs. You've worked with, you know, a bunch of different orchestras. Uh, I had the good fortune to sit with you in the section on a few uh, orchestral gigs. Uh, some commercial ones were pretty fun. But also, like, yeah. you you do, like, a lot of the, um, uh, you know, you do, like, a lot of solo gigs and, you know, playing your compositions and things like that. And, uh, you know, you recently also, a couple of years ago, did a performance of Eddie Sorter's Focus in Brisbane as well. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about that? Because this is this is like a pretty, you know, uh, significant work for, um, you, you know, like yeah, the story goes, you know, as I said, Stan Getz, it was written for Stan Getz and, you know, it was, it was quite one of those really significant works for that third stream genre. And, you know, how did it yeah. come about for you and how, what was your take on it? Because it's all, you know, pretty much improvised, right? Yeah. Um... Yeah, Adrian Head, he conducts a, um, like a community stream orchestra up here. So um, he asked me to do it. So and you um, like, yep. I went, all right, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, yeah. so, yeah, I ordered it and um, I found it really challenging, actually. I think I, like the, like the chords are just, you know, like, yeah, complex change a lot. And they're all over the shop. And I'm not quite sure they're always right. Um, and the, like, just the way the charts are laid out, I actually ended up having to rewrite most of the charts, like in a way that like made sense to me. So right, okay. she's spent quite a lot of time, you know, sort of like playing along with it and all of that. So, and then, um, but it was great, you know, like to yeah, get deep into that. And it's brilliant. Yeah, like a really great piece. Huh? Mm. Um, but I think even Stan, you know, it baffled Stan a little. He had to go home and I believe overdub some of it. So yeah, uh, there's, there's a uh, they re-released it recently with some alternative takes, I believe, because he yeah definitely had to have a few goes at some of the movements in particular. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. But a real yeah, yeah, like yeah, a real challenge to play. Yeah. Um, and you know, I it was it was a bit of a challenge as well. I, I think there was a bit of resistance. Um, in the orchestra itself like because you know uh a community string orchestra and the um yeah they're not they're not so hot on their rhythms a lot of the time so i think it was just a bit yeah yeah perhaps they didn't enjoy it so much right and you know, i listen back to it and I go, hey it's okay it's okay i would like to do it in a, in a more um yeah better circumstance in a way but i yeah but it was wonderful to do right you know yeah. just the intonation and my own thing and it's just like ah yeah so yeah yeah but um yeah that's the story of that one yeah yeah no it's just it's interesting because as i said like it's um i think before you dale barlow was probably the only one to have performed that here in australia i think oh wow i'd love to hear that is there a recording of that one or how was it um look i saw it as a kid on abc but i i've, yeah, so I've yet yet to find it anywhere yeah. yeah yeah but um yeah it definitely made an impression on me um now uh yeah just sort of going back uh like uh, as i said we touched on the orchestral uh side of things like you know it's you know it's sort of something that you know sometimes we get the opportunity to do you know sit there and play with the orchestra in whatever context do you have a favorite favorite orchestral uh concert experience and if so what was the the program or you know what was it that sort of made it memorable for you oh i've, I've got heaps of them and for diff different reasons you know right. like, maybe give us um, your top two or three <laughs> i really loved doing um doing um nixon in china oh yeah uh, that was with really the film when i was over there and that was just because it's such a meaty part and these awesome rhythms and it was mm. just like this really yeah yeah just be super focused and it's like this is such a great saxophone part for it and you know sax quartet and yeah, yeah. yeah so that was um yeah so i loved doing that um yeah and then you know i kind of really enjoyed okay let's say like as a as a bunch of gigs into one like i, I went through a stage where i was doing sort of like you know with like uh, george benson and natalie cole and people mm -hmm. like that were, were coming through and they were really in fun just because you know there's tim minch and all of that because the crowd just goes mental right and it's just yeah. like and it's like a, the whole thing's like a big party and then you're just involved in this massive sound and it's just like a yeah it's a good feeling you know so mm. yeah yeah so many i always love playing with orchestras but that's yeah 
that's just I, I could go on about that, but I'll draw the line of that. So, okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, now your um, uh, I mean, as I said, there's so many different experiences. Is there any any anything else that sort of that stands out as a you know a, a real career highlight performance wise for you in terms of uh, like a performance you've done? Oh, no, not really. I just Fair like enough. any, any yeah. I mean, I guess there's like any, any gig where like, and it doesn't matter what it is, but any gig where you get a certain feeling of just like, yeah, just being totally in the moment and losing time. And that could be any genre doing anything, right? Yeah, it could yeah. be, yeah. Um, yeah. And then that's what sticks out, you know, it's just like, wow, that was kind of like weird what happened there. You know, it was just like, yeah, like the atmosphere changed or something, right? So, mm. and that's sort of like a separate thing from any music that's being played or anything. And that's what, yeah, that's what I, yeah, I really love, you know, when that happens. So, yeah. yeah. And that could happen, you know, any time, any gig, you just don't know. Yeah. It can. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And then it's got like that again. As soon as you, as soon as you go, oh, this yeah. is cool. Oh, wait. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where am I? What's going on? You know, there's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a good yeah. challenge. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. Well, let, let's move on. Um, now we've talked about, well, as like everyone knows, you're like just yeah, probably one of the, um, and you know, as part of my doctoral research, you're one of the people I've interviewed. Is like you know, you're one of the people who can actually you know juggle quite successfully between different styles. And yeah, you, know, you can put on your, your jazz hat and then your your contemporary improv hat and your composer hat and then you can do your bust out classical chops. Um, and you just seem to do it, you know, so well, like, how do you maintain such a high level proficient proficiency, um, on so many different genres? Um, well, I'm not really sure I do maintain it. I think there's like a, um, like, I think at various times I've reached high levels in those genres, but like kind of, you know, at some point they become suboptimal, <laughs> you know, so, and, right. but I've got, like, I just like, I, I've got a baseline where I'm at and where mm -hmm. I'm playing. And then when an opportunity comes up, I can go in that direction or that okay. direction or that direction. Right. Um, so, and I think that's how I play it. Right. Because yeah. otherwise I'll go absolutely insane. Um, and I used to struggle a lot more with it, you know, or stress a lot more out, uh, uh, you know, stress a more, lot more about it, but it's, um, you know, now I know that, yeah, I've done it a few times. Yeah, it takes me that long. I can kind of, yeah, I can yeah. get that back, right? So, right. yeah. So, yeah, it is a bit of a juggling act, of course. So, yeah, it sort of depends on the gig and then you kind of, you know, work towards that particular thing. That's sort of what you're saying there, pretty much? Well, it's just a shift of focus rather than, a, I mean, yeah, you could say it's a juggling act or like, yeah, a, like, yeah strobe, genre strobe or whatever, well, but yeah. it's like, it's, it's more just, yeah. it's just go, oh, I'm doing this now, right? Or I'm doing that now. You know? Yeah, okay. And then every now and then you get a curveball. And it's just like, ah, oh, yeah, right, okay. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to do that as well as I like, but it's like, hey, yeah. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. It yeah, is it is. I often surprise myself too, right? So, yeah. yeah. But it's, yeah. Um, here's a tough one. If you had to choose one style of music to play in, um, and you know you had to choose one which style would it be and why oh, oh god yeah yeah <laughs> um well i think i think it would um yeah definitely be uh focused yeah something where i can use my creativity in right so yeah so it would be some sort of impro but i but i i really like um yeah what how, how about i put it like this I think I'll call it like like medium sized ensemble uh, guerrilla impro or something like that, right? So it's like you, you kind of like maybe have seven, nine players and they have, uh, you no, know, so you can get the power of a big band, but you've got the flexibility and malleability of a small group, but like an immense amount of color as well a lot of options to break down into smaller things right mm -hmm. so it's a kind of like um i i think if yeah you know i i would like just to kind of like lead and write a group like that which is kind of where i'm going with with forage right but it's mm -hmm. just um yeah 
and and I've, I've tried these things in the past but i keep coming back to it i think there's a lot of possibilities there so and that goes back like hearts right back to like you know um thread deal and mingus and even listening to like kind of um always like smaller chamber things like donatoni's chamber works and yeah. you know things things like that where there's just like this incredible tapestry of sound um so that would be my genre you know somewhere where i can yeah 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 be creative do your own thing pretty much yeah nice yeah yeah um cool all right now um if say if there's like a younger musician who um wanted to say uh, like be a performer but you know sort of be able to sort of switch between different styles and things like similar to what you do in terms of uh you know jumping uh stylistic ships so to speak uh, depending on yeah. what the scenario is and stuff what things would you advise for a, like a younger musician who's looking to go down that path in terms of what they can do to help them develop mi musical versatility and what sort of things would you suggest they work on or start working on or go check out and investigate to help them with that um well i well probably like just a a decent study of like how music evolves and how interconnected everything is and like they're not as separate as actually they're not really very separate in my mind you know like in, in by saying that like everything comes from this like these common sources and then branches out becomes like re remarkably different with these little cultural feedback loops but in in essence you know there are just a lot of like a lot of similar concepts uh expressed in different ways so um I'm trying to get a head around, like get the head around that. Um, like practically speaking, on the saxophone. I mean, we haven't really touched on this, um, but I have like say just take the alto, right? Um, mm -hmm. I I play the Mark Six with an A8 Van Doren three and a half uh, reed um, for um, for jazz, and and well, I'm working on a concept at the moment for classical again with a three and a half band or a reed, but on a different saxophone, the Super Action Series Two. Mm -hmm. In that way, I kind of manage to keep my sound concepts a little bit different. Not that I can't switch over with them, you know, but like say if I was going to take the Mark Six into like uh, a saxophone quartet, it's I like I would I'd have to work a lot harder at tuning it, mm. um, uh, and and where if I take the Super Action into an improvisation situation, like like I tend to sound like some weird, um, you know, <laughs> weird computer or something, right? Cause it's so <laughs> clean and it all works, right? Like, yeah, yeah. you know, and I've got these like kind of like chops with all these like weird angular things and these strange rhythms. And it's just like, oh, and it's almost too easy to execute. So it's just like, yeah, it gets a bit out. <laughs> but you know, and, and, that, and that's fun to do as well. So like, yeah, equipment wise, I, I tend to definitely, definitely separate the concepts. But when I'm practicing, like I talk about, like how I have a, a, like a baseline that I can kind of like go off in any direction from. Mm -hmm. But this thing is pure fundamentals, right? I just like, um, you know, I just sort of like keep my embouchure in shape, um, and like I, I'm always just working on uh, yeah different subdivisions and rhythms with my articulation and like like actually just away from any peaks just like as general concepts right mm -hmm. um and also just like kind of always working on variety of the, the oral cavity you know um uh, whatever pitch bending or whatever you know whatever it involves right um just to get like so you can get subtleties of tuning right like because that combined with 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 a dynamic control means you can make chords sound fantastic you know which is like something like like i really got playing tenor with sax quartets it's like you got to have the right volume as well as the right pitch right mm. to kind of like make those chords sing and it's a real challenge um but you know so i'm always like working on those things which i think are applicable to every genre right so because uh yeah basically so uh and technique technique you know i'm always kind of working on um you know if you could rationally look at the saxophone like an interval machine just like how you know what what are you what what are the weaknesses right you know um how do you kind of like i did a lot of a lot of work at one point um and this is one thing you know like kind of when i came back from new york that first time when i realized that somehow i had um developed a lot of tension in my playing right okay um so i worked a lot 
on developing a super relaxed kind of technique. So, um, yeah, and I find that that's, yeah, so I always kind of revisit that. Um, yeah, and it's fun, you know, like, yeah, like, I mean, I, I find, I, I think one of your questions that you wanted to ask was like, should classical musicians learn to improvise, right? Yeah. Um, I, um, I, I think it's, a, I, I think it's a great practice way to practice your horn and kind of like, because your intuition quite often, you know, leads to things you, you cannot do. Um, yeah. so you kind of got to arc back and master them and incorporate them. And, you know, uh, I, I, I mean, I wouldn't sort of like make anyone improvise, you know, <laughs> like if someone wants to do it, they can, but like, um, I think there's an unnecessary fear about it, you know? People yeah. say, oh, you know, I'm awful at it. I'm like, well, no, it's just like you haven't made like any choices about what you want to sound like and you haven't kind of like developed your own language. I mean, uh, at, at a really basic level, like improvisation is absolutely unavoidable, right? Mm. So it's like, like people are doing it. Like, it's just like we're all humans improvise whether they like it or not every day just to yeah. get through life, right? So say with music, you know, it's like, yeah, there's like that, that base la layer of when you're like, you screw something up in a piece and you got to recover very quickly, just using, you know, you know, you MacGyver it with what, whatever skills you've got, you need to just kind of make it work. And it, quite often it's a gift, you know, it sounds good, you know, but it's, um, yeah. And it's just like, kind of like, like sort of branching it out and making improvisation more of an art, you know, focusing on it and cultivating it. So, yeah. Um, you know, like Baroque, you know, like I, I, it's, you look at, you know, it was just like, I, I gather it was just kind of quite standard in Baroque for people to have improvisation skills, but within a cultural context, right? Within a local context and there's these like rules, just like, like we've got a series of questions now, we just like kind of like open form ranting about it, right? It's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, so um, it's not like there's no rules or there's no discipline. And I think these are like, there's a lot of misconceptions, I think, amongst classical musicians about what improvisation actually is. So, yeah, yeah. unnecessary fear. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, so, I think, yes. So, the short answer is it would be very beneficial and I would encourage it. But, like, you know, I couldn't be bothered forcing any of my students to learn it if they don't want to. I find it very hard. I find it very hard, like, to teach um, sometimes improvisation. Um, yeah. Well, I think the big the big challenge is um, you probably there needs to be a willingness to sort of open you, know, you sort of open your mind to trying it out, I guess, and you know that's that's sort of definitely on the student's part. Like you can't, as you say, you can't sort of say, "Hey, do this," but you know there has to be that they have to sort of want to try it, and I think that's certainly an important step, I guess. Yeah, it, it takes yeah, and it takes more time. Yeah, than um, one always imagines to actually kind of embody these things and remember them, right? It's just like, yeah, yeah, because you're always kind of like getting into these areas. You, you, at some point, you'll always be some like you always be lost. You'll always be somewhere fresh, right? It's the mm -hmm. nature of the East. So, yeah, but I mean, also like just depends on what you know. Like you look at kind of um, aleatoric works. And, and cage and you know like any, anything like that you know you, you want to approach any of that i mean and they're like kind of in a way like way composers made made it safe for classical musicians to improvise right yeah so through graphic scores and things like this right i think they, that they really they really did it's like look you don't uh, you don't have to kind of like develop a, you know a personality in your improvisation you don't have to kind of like be like hey like this is like on this it's not synonymous with originality and like kind of groundbreaking you can just be like you know making a choice yeah i'm gonna play this note and then i'm gonna play that note i'm not gonna react to that you know and that's why i think it's interesting you know perhaps there's stepping stones through some of these um, more open works like starting from the, yeah, the 50s Mm. yeah uh, um no that's all very uh yeah interesting and yeah fascinating and it, it's good that you sort of mentioned that because the next lot of questions i was going to ask you is actually talking about your improvisation but um we'll get into that now um so you uh as we said you're and as you've said very much uh you can improvise you know in a jazz context and also in 
a more contemporary avant-garde style as well. Uh, do you see a distinction or um, can, is there a differentiation between those two styles for you in the way that you would approach those improvisations? Um, well, I guess so. I mean, because like, like if you, like when you say kind of, well, I, I mean, guess. Well, let me qualify this by saying that, like, you know, I try and get that same kind of like, like, same feeling of, of spontaneity and kind of like, I don't know, like, like, kind of not, not trying to play remembered kind of habits, you know, but actually trying to respond to the environment, right? But like, mm -hmm. it differs, like, because one, one, you got like these cycles of chord changes, right? Uh, and then, and then, and also like a melody that you kind of like, in a way, like, you're bound to kind of create melodic variations on, right? To always have that. This is like a, what would you say? Like a cancer's firmness going through your mind the whole yeah, time yeah. improvising, right? Um, and it's like this unseen thread that is a logic that binds everyone together and is occasionally alluded to, right? Um, perhaps stated at the start and the end, but like it's, um, but then like in the contemporary, uh, you know, if you're talking about more of a can, like contemporary classical improvisation, Mm -hmm. um, I don't mean depend, it depends on if a composer is telling me to do something or not, right? So, so quite often, like the, yeah, you, you're quite confined in the, in the improvisations there, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's um, some funny stories, but it's <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> but uh, but I mean, there's also like uh, you know the improvisation of process, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think. Um, and a classic example of this is someone like Evan Parker. And, and he embodies that whole aesthetic of the free scene, right? It's just like where you, know, you, you, you find like, I guess an almost anti-instrument approach. You know, you find all the sounds and blah, 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 and you, yeah. And then you kind of like, you know, you develop a style through that. Mm -hmm. But I, I love the way he circular breathed and just like kind of like moved his fingers and got three or four lines going at the one time. Um, and then it becomes about something else, right? Mm. Um, that's a totally different approach, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But perhaps yeah. you can get the same feeling from it, too. So, yeah. Okay. Totally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, yeah. So in terms of, uh, like, when you're approaching improvisation, uh, like, yeah. as we sort of said, it sort of depends on the context, and I guess, you know, each style has its own sort of parameters that you can work within. Do you yeah. find sometimes that sometimes the you get a bit jumbled up, or uh, say that you try and interject, uh, say like a, some hard bop lines into say like a, an avant-garde uh, avant-garde aleatoric kind of improvisation sort of thing, or vice versa? Like, do you find sometimes you sort of mesh up the different sort of uh, mindsets and approaches to improvisation in different musical settings? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um... Yeah, I don't think so, unless I'm like consciously kind of code switching, right? Okay. So, I, yeah, I mean, and that, um, I, I mean, I might, I might, maybe I use the same fingering patterns, but it would sound different because I'm responding. It just is so contextual with what's going on mm. around, right? Like, I, I'd never kind of like pull out Parker Link only because I don't know any, but it's like, <laughs> yeah, but it's generally not. I wouldn't say never, but yeah. Mm. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, now... it's like, well, look, can I, can I like give like a slightly left field example, right? Sure. Like one which has, um, like I've had to work on a fair bit to get through, but it's like when improvising in 4-4, four, four, you sometimes put a 3-4 bar in. Or when improvising in 3-4, four, four, you sometimes put a 4-4 four, four bar in. Okay. You know, yes. When you're playing in seven, do you sometimes like lose the one or you know in 13 do you like kind of you know it's like you play 14 right mm -hmm. because it's like you're not yeah it's like you got to work actually to um yeah to not do that and then eventually you don't right because yeah. it's like it's fine right but at first yeah they happen accidentally so i put it in that in that category of it's just like yeah Okay. You know, the mind has different, yeah. 
different tracks and once you're on one yeah yeah it's yeah. like yeah it's like i haven't heard you swear once during this interview right not yet but thanks not yet <laughs> oh, yeah, we're working on that right thanks that's, thanks that's, that's it. <laughs> um Okay, so um, yeah. no, that's interesting because I was just sort of curious, um, just from my own sort of thoughts, like thinking about you know, because you do so many different things. Like you know, is it possible that you know sometimes you might you subconsciously might interject something that's from a completely different sound word world to what you're playing in currently or something like that? But no, that's that's interesting. no. I mean, I do. I, yeah, I do often play stuff that's wrong, but not in not not kind of like yeah. I don't yeah, not like you're saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, no, no that's cool. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Now you said that you do, you do try and, um, uh, I mean, you don't force students, but you do, you, you know, if they are willing to have a crack in improvisation, it's something you do teach. How, do, how do you sort of start off someone um, to develop improvisation skills, particularly if it's say someone who's like come from a classical background? Yeah. I mean, this is a real, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't, I don't know if I'm terribly kind of good at doing that, but it's like, I, I think, um, definitely just start off by, um, playing things back and forth, you know, like, like a call and response. Yeah. I'll just play, like, I do this with like, like kind of like grade three kids, for instance. Right. Or, yep. you know, um, you know, I'll just play a rhythm, play another one, play another one, play another one. And say you, you know, get them to play it back, um, and then um, you know, then might get them to start like, hey, that's a really cool rhythm. Why, why are you like, um, you know, like just start to split it? Let's just like put it between two notes, like. And I think part of the art is like kind of like doing it in a way where someone like you don't give anyone a chance to kind of get their gears locked, right? Mm -hmm. um and it's like yeah do that do that and then you know like sort of you're playing over it and then like i, I do like building up songs slowly right so i might play another i like uh, like a free idea over that like but i'll limit it to like two two three notes and then i'm gonna hey you know like i'm gonna do what you're doing now you do what i'm doing and you know so like like do things quite quite generally at first right and then if they're really good at it like let's make another section you know let's add a few more notes but there's a real like, you know, and, and actually, yeah, you can do a lot of really interesting stuff and, and kids come up with some great stuff, you know? Yeah. Um, and yeah, so it's like how to do it in this non-threatening way of like kind of walking someone down, like, like just like with extreme limitation at first and then, yeah. um, or, or sometimes like, you know, what I might do is just like go to the other extreme and just like kind of like go, all right, what I want you to do is just kind of like blow as hard as you can and just keep moving your fingers. Go. And then I'll go back at them, right? You know, and I'll just keep going. I won't stop, you know, like, and, 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 and it might be five minutes, but eventually they'll fold. You know? <laughs> and that's like, and, and that's another way of approaching improvisation, right? Because yeah. just they're going to kind of like, you know, they're going to start to fall natural. They're going to start to find something or, you know, it's also a way, you know, it's good finger exercise, <laughs> good for the jobs, you know, but it's like, I, I actually, I do use improvisation a lot as a way um, to, um, yeah, to covertly teach other things, okay. you know, to build strength. Um, to build articulation strength because you know like if you're playing a piece of music quite often you need, it's a lot of stop start but if you're improving and you're like you're developing this kind of like you got this kind of repetitive thing going mm. yeah you get tight pretty quickly right so yeah but it's um what what i the biggest challenge i find with um with teaching improvisation is yeah like getting people to make changes like, mm -hmm. you know, when we think of changes in the traditional sense of like going to C7 or F7 or, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, and it's pretty easy, like trying to, to begin someone on that road, you know, go, yeah, just play the tonic and then play the tonic and the third and, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and, and then, yeah, but then once you get more complex changes, it's, you know, this is where we get to the point where someone's got to really want it and they've got to put in the work, yeah. right? 
Um, so I guess what I'm saying is I, I can get people to, yeah, you can get people to improvise conceptually. Mm -hmm. So um, like, like I like memory games and things like that. You know, it's like, yeah, uh, you know, or how to, you know, how to slightly vary things, you know, to teach people like that. Uh, other than that, you know, what do you do? You just like, you know, get people to play transcriptions, learn melodies off the record, simple yeah, things. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how do you do it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, um, that's similar sort of things to what you you've described, I think. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, you've definitely, uh, yeah, it's sort of, there has to be yeah, a lot of drive from the student to want to do it, I think, because there, there are points they sort of go, oh, it's a bit a bit tricky or convoluted, um, as you say, like particularly when you start getting into more intricate tra changes. But the, the point you were saying before about how, um, and you mentioned this previously as well, is where you know, that skill of improvising, um, it's, it's an important thing like that you can use to help you in your practice, like your everyday practice in terms of problem solving. So like dealing with, like even if it's a notated piece or something like that, uh, say yeah, you're in the sure. eBear and there's like, you know, there's lots of nasty things in totally. there or whatever. Yeah. And, you know, you could beat your head around the bush uh, against the wall, sorry, and you're just yeah. trying to you know, play it over and over and over, not make anywhere, but, you know, trying to deconstruct it and find ways to approach it from different angles and try and be creative yeah. and work it out. And I think that's an important uh, thing about improvisation that it, maybe a lot of people don't realize who do I classic think, music. I think you can give a piece of really like, um, yeah, and give it. Yeah, it's nice to have a few. I mean, I guess particularly in slower pieces as well, right? Um, yeah. To have a few different options up your sleeve about how to play it, so you can kind of bring a spon spontaneous feeling to it when you're performing, mm. and you're not going, "Ah, oh, I only have learned this one way, and I've tried to play it in this one way every time." Yep. Um, which I don't think actually many people do. Right? No, no, no. And it's just like, and that's what I mean by um, improvisation is inevitable. Yeah. Whether someone likes it or not, they're going to be doing it. They may not call it that, but they're doing it, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. No, it's it's interesting. Um, look, yeah. we do have to move on though because we could chat all night about it. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Bring it, bring it on. Um, what's what's that, next? That's all good. Um, so I'd just like to talk about your comp your composing now. Um, now you know you you're getting right into it uh you've just recently uh completed your doctorate um which we'll talk about shortly but first of all how how did you first get into composing what was sort of the the thing that kick-started it for you uh well i think i think i was doing little composition things that you like in writing techniques at uni and i just realized it was kind of cool i could construct these things and then uh you know i put a band together and and yeah, and I wrote for that. And I was just always, yeah, just like gradually, like gradually, I would say, in small steps. Um, and yeah, it's just, it's just built layer upon layer upon layer, you know? Okay. And in a way, it had never been a foreground thing until I, yeah, decided to do the doctorate. I went, hey, you know, like, I kind of want to do a doctorate. Um, I don't really want to do a performance. It's like, yeah, so I, I like to do it in composition. So, yeah. Okay. So I kind of, yeah, stepped forth into that yeah yeah so yeah just and i mean like the short answer as well is that like i just started writing for people i was playing with right yeah so just using them as the you know experimenting so yeah, yeah. human guinea pigs and, and yeah and, and also <laughs> like it becomes like I, I got quite into this like there's a couple of aspects to it because it's like um i really liked how some players you know because of that the performer composer thing right and i I think a lot of performers and improvisers, they write their music out of a necessity, necessity to kind of like frame their own style. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that's what I started to do as well. Okay. Okay. Hey, well, I've got this kind of like weird hybrid intro style because I've got this classical technique and I've kind of like developed these patchwork knowledge of kind of like post bop jazz and free stuff, right? Mm. Um, what compositions would suit that? Mm -hmm yeah yeah and then yeah and I, and I like the idea as well of uh, of, of someone like um yeah someone like Ellington or Mingus and they just write for you know like for the for players personalities right so I find it hard to compose if I haven't got someone in mind mm. even in, in whatever genre right so if I'm writing continuum I've got continuum in mind when I'm writing yeah 
I know, I, I know when I'm writing something, it's like someone's going to have a go at me, you know? But I write it anyway. Or to flatter them or, you know, whatever. You know, I've got to be mine. Like, it's a pragmatic thing from being a performer. I think I can't get away from that. So, yeah. yeah. Mm. Cool. Um, now, you're uh, just uh, sort of curious with your the compositional process in terms of you writing. Is yeah. it similar to how you would approach an improvisation? Is it like sort of playing around with ideas, improvising on it, and then jotting it down? Or is it a completely different process in terms of writing a, a, a composed piece of music? Uh, well, I guess I, I'd see it as like, I think there's a large element of improvisatory action in my mm -hmm. composing. And so it's like, um, let's just take notated music, right? So I, I just, I do try and write fairly quickly mm -hmm. and then I'll go back and, uh, and I will kind of like, so you could look at it as a series of overdubs or, you know, um, but it's not, it's not, not as linear as, as a live improvisation, right? That's purely linear. You can't get away from it. Right. Yeah, yeah. But when you're composing, you can kind of go back and you can, you can start in the middle and go to the back and you can kind of like do all sorts of stuff. Right. And it becomes like, a, a like, you know, palimpsest as well, sometimes depending on what I'm writing, where, you know, like, like there's like, you know, five or six revisions. And then there's like, kind of like little glimpses of the first and second and third kind of popping through, but overlaid by this, this new material, because like, um, yeah. And I find this re like working and reworking I, I like about composing. So, you know, it's almost like, um, yeah, I'm, I'm iterating until like, oh, I've got it. I've got it. That's it. Right. It's the only way it can be or something like that. Yeah. Or I might like write, do things like I might write a series of like kind of painstakingly kind of like write out this is what some stuff I've experimented with, like write out processes, um, you know, like perfectly logical processes, but um, they don't sound that great. So I start to kind of like, um, destroy the processes, you know, that I spent so much time writing, you know, right. <laughs> try to make it sound good. It doesn't always work, but it's like, you can get quite interesting sounds from it, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so creation and destruction, right? Yeah, yeah. And we'll put sustenance in there somewhere as well, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Now, you're uh, in the term, in the the method that you compose is it um like does it start off on the saxophone clarinet a, a piano or like what's sort of your main tool that you use oh well, it, it really does vary okay. um you know sometimes i just write i mean look i miss actually like i miss having a piano i really like composing at the piano mm -hmm. um like i i'm not a great piano player but like um i just like there was a period of time whenever a student didn't show up, I would just sit at the piano and play chords and just do all sorts of stuff. I would just play and play and play and explore. Like I couldn't read piano music to save my life, but I can actually kind of like play a lot of stuff on it and mm -hmm. no chords and, you know, so, um, so I find that a really interesting way to explore. Uh, quite often it comes from a rhythmic problem I want to explore. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, sometimes it just really does vary. Like, okay. you know, I could do it on finale. Like, I really like composing directly onto finale and just listening to the awful MIDI playback, <laughs> you know? Um, but just like typing in trial and error, going, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, that's cool, you know? Um, yeah. So, all sorts, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would yeah. be a concept. Yeah. Cool. Um, now, uh, what, are, uh, what are some sort of recent uh, compositions that you've uh, been working on or have worked on and um, uh, maybe you could just sort of give us a very sort of brief uh, idea about what the concept of those works are if there's anything like in particular recently uh, we will be talking about your doctorate stuff but maybe anything uh -huh. external from that yeah well I haven't I, well yeah I haven't been composing anything really like since my doctorate, actually, okay. I mean, little pieces, right? Yep. So, so perhaps I'll talk about something I was rehearsing the other day. I, I, I've never written for Munkle, but I decided, hey, I want to write some tunes for Munkle, right? Okay. And sort of like almost like take a hybrid of, of uh, Julian and Sam's writing and kind of like, you know, try and write quirky twee melodies and weird kind of like, you know, mm. um, sort of like, you know, take sort of, 
almost like take well-known tunes and just morph them into something unrecognizable. So you're going, oh, that's kind of like, sounds like, but ah, oh, maybe, I don't know, right? But like short, short form things like, uh, so, so melodic with, with only short opportunities for solos sort of thing. And like kind of generally pretty genre based. So I've just been mucking around with that, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's nice. I've been reading it through with people up here and I think I might put something together up here using that. So this is nothing like that really up here. I don't think at the moment. So okay. yeah, like someone playing just stupid melodies, which are kind of fun, but yeah. like virtuosic and weird, you know? Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. Um, all right. No, that's cool. So sort of, uh, curious. If that's the only thing, but I, I'm not, I haven't been writing anything kind of like getting my teeth into anything like deeper than that really yeah okay uh, yeah yeah well like, yet no. yeah well not yet no. yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 all right cool um now in like for uh say if there's someone who's like a you know a, a great performer and you know would like to try and venture into composition um uh, say like someone who uh, uh example me i tried it once and it backfired horrendously um yeah. but you know what if there's someone who like would like to sort of get into the world of composing what sort of things would you suggest that they you know start off um uh yeah, looking into or trying out experimenting with yeah i just think really someone said it's you know when i was whinging about not having composed anything for a while the other week someone said what well, don't you just gotta put like paper <laughs> I go, yeah you've got a good True. point you know yeah. just like and it's gonna like um i i think just the acceptance that a whole lot of what you're gonna write is gonna sound awful you've got to be willing to throw a lot of stuff out yeah i think that's like not to get disheartened by that and um and it's like sometimes it's you know it's difficult presenting your music like i i in, on the rare occasions where I've been listening to other people perform my music, I'm always like more nervous, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, but it's like, um, it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to hear your own mm. music. So, um, so I'm more, much more in my comfort zone where I'm, when I'm participating. So, yeah, yeah. but it's, um, yeah, but I think, I think that's it. Just put pen to paper, just write something and, and yeah, get someone around to play it and just like be prepared for them to tell you it's, it's yeah doesn't work or you make you make that conclusion mm. yeah but something good will come it'll happen you know yeah. quite often it's like um like and i think it comes down to like we were talking about improvisation you know before it's like you know this sort of like this this um conflation with of, of like composing with like being really original uh, i don't think it's a necessity at all like just try and write something totally like yeah Try and write something really boring. Try and write something really cliche. Um, see what happens. You probably find it pretty hard to do. I mean, mm -hmm. so it'll come out differently to how you expect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it always comes out differently to how I expect. So if I'm stuck, you know, yeah, I might just sort of like, yeah, try and write something tanglish, right? For instance. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then go, yeah. hey, it sort of like, it just emerges. So start from what you know and yeah. then go from there. Yeah. Cool. Mm. all right no thanks for that sharing that um yeah I'm, I'm, right. I, might give, I might give that a go <laughs> yeah. um relocate um now yeah so let, let's talk about the doctorate because oh, this was like a big big part of your <laughs> your time recently yeah, and yeah yeah and you know it's no small feat to complete a doctorate it's uh it really does you know it's, it's a it's, jungle it's, isn't it it's it just sure like, is or slash labyrinth or yeah i don't know yeah it's like yeah. being in the middle of a jungle with just a plastic knife to cut through the foliage it really is yeah it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's quite a quite a mountain to overcome yeah but, and, then, um, and then you get to the end of the jungle and the end of the river and there's kurtz your man yeah. <laughs> right you know yeah yeah exactly exactly <laughs> yeah. um maybe yeah. you could talk us through what because you, you did say it was um on composition but maybe you talk us through what the the research topic was in particular and maybe talk us through some of the the compositions that you wrote for it and the idea but ideas behind those okay i'll try and be brief or like logical in a way i explain yeah. I'll, I'll 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 start from my like i didn't know what i wanted to do right mm -hmm. i needed to, to choose something i need to choose quickly um and i've always been fascinated by um 
by the emotionality that you can get from microtones and the in-between the cracks things, getting away from equal temperament. And I just wondered how I could uh, explore that, you know, and I, and I was listening at that time to a great album, uh, you know, by Steve Lehman, who who'd sort of been starting to fuse some spectral ideas, like he'd made this vibraphone, um, you know, like retuned uh, and was, yeah, doing these great sounds. And, and I sort of like, and I'd also been listening to spectralism for the last couple of years, which mm -hmm. is like a school in a school of like Gerard Grise, Tristan Murai, who were like, they're famous actually for taking uh, analyses of sound um, and orchestrating them, right? So sonograms. Mm -hmm. um, so I thought, okay, here's, here's like actually a school of composition that I've totally overlooked. Like um, I just really don't know what's going on there at all. Um, maybe I can retune some instruments, you know, um, and, and just explore this sort of thing. Um, yeah, and that, and that took me down the rabbit hole from there. And so I really did, um, yeah, I, I did I did probably three three major compositions that I handed in. The first one was for Chamber Orchestra, um, and this was done for the Modern Music Ensemble at the Con. Um, and the idea was like, um, I should say say that yeah, like the first couple of pieces uh, didn't explore like spectral, like the harmonic spectral ideas um, so much, right? Like it used microtones, but it was much more um, intuitive, or you know, like I I I was thinking it was it was going to be like kind of like quite a challenge to get like um, students to kind of like play these fine increments of tuning right i just thought it was a nightmare scenario but i was getting like um yeah much more interested actually in how uh gerard grise in particular um but it, it, as a general thing evolve make these slow evolutions of form uh and and it turns out actually that like they were interested in a whole lot of other ideas. Like for instance, um, one that grabbed me, which I found a good connection to improvisation was um, like, how do you translate the perception of continuity? Like, like our perception of continuity as human beings um, into musical form. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it's basically like, you know, they kind of looked into the philosoph philosophical ideas of like, just feedback loops basically and these um and then like memories and impressions gradually subside in layers um and then new ones come in and it's like kind of this multi-dimensional thing right um and they kind of started constructing their forms through these feedback loops um like, like in interleaved loops i guess because they're not all starting beginning at the same time like processes would come in then they would leave right so i really started to write um yeah i i explore this idea because i thought that this has some meta implications right because like uh these these guys are like kind of writing this music which is kind of translating the present moment into form and that's the very material that an improviser works with so i thought that was pretty cool um and so i i did that and i kind of combined that with another one of their formal interests which was the movement from um or the movement to and from uh, order to chaos, right? From consonants to dissonance, which they kind of um, like equated with, uh, you know, syntropy, syntropy to entropy, you know, like kind of um, how do things break down? And I thought this was the perfect kind of idea of like kind of gradually moving from um, composition, you know, notation to mm. improvisation. So I gradually opened things up more and more to improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I had sort of like a system of kind of like up arrows and down arrows because I wanted to just like people to kind of like explore just micro deviations. So it was quite a challenging work, I think, in a lot of ways, um, uh, you know, aesthetically and sonically for the ensemble to get around. Mm. Uh, I, look, I listen back to it now and I think I actually, they kind of, you know, Daryl Pratt did an amazing job with them, uh, you know, so he loved it, you know, it was cool. Um, and I was, yeah, I was lucky to be able to do it did my head in like yeah. <laughs> i've never notated something that large it was just like <laughs> really hurt. um uh, and the next one was much easier because i was involved with um uh a uh, actually 
story is that like a friend of mine, Angela Wagstaff, an artist, she, she was um, studying um, uh, making etchings, right? So mm-hmm. she took like a whole lot of these prints of my score um, and made these etchings, but actually the um, she took a whole lot of these, um, like some of the ideas of uh, processes that I had and transfer them to the way that she made these etchings. So she took an improvisational approach and developed her own systems for these, right? Okay. Um, and then uh, I, we, we turned this in for the Vivid Festival into um, a scrolling animation, which then I wrote some more music for, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, and that was really cool. And this was like really quite open. Uh, this was for my, um, for like I re tuned some strings on the guitar, I prepared the piano, um so we had and we had our violin drums um that was that was a lot of fun right and then i think yeah in the in the last work in the deep end um was where my ideas came together how i really wanted them to uh um, so i well i could get it there i've got like it's a bet and gold that i i bought on my travels and i like i like pretty much i just went i i, I kind of like did that um bowed it smashed it took some <laughs> took some sonic samples of it right <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. um and i use this as the basis of the composition so i um emily granger uh this first time i met her she thankfully kind of agreed to do this crazy work so like we did a seven seven octave you know scored a shura on her harp wow. and she's like mortified she's going you make me sound awful I'm like, hey, sorry, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then i got uh ben carey to kind of like um tune these like sine waves um to you know to some of these pictures as well as bringing samples of the of the gong the original gong which you could improvise and manipulate um and then like the piano once again prepared yep um but i just prepared all the notes that were like kind of scorchature on the heart, right? So it was just like this random displacement. Um, and this was like an hour, like epic work, which re- recorded for uh, Judith Nielsen at the uh, at Dangrove. Okay. Uh, oh, actually, no, well, I did it at the con originally, but we did a, a, um, it was a really nice recording of it without the prepared piano because they wouldn't let me do that. Um, uh, yeah, Dangrove, like a 20 minute thing, which I really like. I look at that and listen to that and go hey it was kind of worth it for that recording yeah i really wish i could write you know you know write more for that group the circumstances of me yeah like yeah being up here and everything it's hard but it's like a really nice group of people to play with it came together there that's the story so like so so in the last one i managed to do both so like these ideas of feedback loops um and order to chaos kind of like traveled all through the project but in the last one i managed to kind of like actually retune things in a way that was, you know, started to make more sense spectrally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Yeah. Sounds like a mass, massive project. Hey, it took a little bit of time. Hey, yeah. <laughs> it was super interesting. A lot of rabbit holes. I learned, I mean, I learned an extraordinary amount. Like, yeah. yeah it, was, it was great. And I think it's sort of like one of those things that, yeah, I, I'll sit on it and probably, you know, in a few years, I'll kind of like come back to that stuff. And I'll go, hey, oh, it's much easier now. <laughs> yeah you've done it once so <laughs> <laughs> yeah it was cool it was good i mean the last you know what it's like you know the last little bit is always like really trying so yeah yeah it's just hard to kind of like get that final level of detail in the written stuff you know? yeah yeah and you send it in and it comes back and it's just like yeah by the time it's done you're just going loud <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 after um, so many years of researching it's just like yeah it's it's done it's yeah it's it's there yeah so yeah, yeah. But, but cool you know like yeah yeah how, how awesome you know to be able to do that so yeah cool. nice yeah. um great well let's move on um with getting to the tail end of the interview um yeah. and again so many great stories but um we'll be talking i'd like to talk now about your your teaching and your experience as an educator now you've mentioned uh you know you you had uh, done some uh, well I, I probably haven't mentioned that, actually sorry um like you had taught um, at some reputable institutions such as the Newcastle Conservatorium, the Sydney Conservatorium, of course, and you're currently now at uh, Queensland Conservatorium, uh, Griffith University. Um, 
going back to uh, your time uh, back in New South Wales, anyway, where, where you're at Newcastle and Sydney, and at a time I believe it was concurrent, uh, uh, you were doing both at the same time simultaneously. Um, maybe you could uh, talk us through, you know, what it was like uh, teaching at those institutions. Like, what was the 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 student culture like in terms of the the, the ones that you saw on how they approach things and um, you know, did you, how did you feel their musical approach and musical tastes were? And yeah, just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, well, the, um, I mean, I was, I was doing the young con stuff. Like I only had a couple of students at Sydney con. So, okay. so it was the young con stuff there, a bit of change of music. Um, so yeah, I don't really have a bigger picture of, of yeah, what was going on there. Um, mm -hmm. But in Newcastle, I was, sorry? You did do some uh, improv classes as I do recall. Oh, I did. Dave so William was running that. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, and then, yeah, so I came in, oh, yeah, that's right, I remember yeah, doing stuff with, with Nexus, that's I right. Was I was in that class. class, and then there was that time you brought in the drum and turned off the lights, and yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was really cool, you know. Yeah, and, that was cool. Yeah, and I remember Marjorie was into a, a lot of that, she'd be in, in uh, Guildhall studying, a lot, uh, you know, a lot of these teaching approaches as well. And, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and yeah, I'd actually gravitated to all of that sort of stuff, and, you know, it was a great, you know, great social experiment too. Mm. Excellent fun, that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's some of my favourite classes, that was. Oh, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there was that too. Yeah. 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 Um, and I think that actually, I think that's a really, um, yeah, it, it's too bad that didn't keep going. Like that was like, because it's, I think it's a really valuable thing. Yeah. You know? Sure. I've got, I've got a mate up here who's like getting into conduct which is like it like conducted improvisations through hand symbols and i think that's that would be a really nice way to connect um people from the different departments hmm. in a non-threatening way you know like because like i found with that uh not not with you guys but like with some of the uh, the other classes you're like you know, people like yeah you know the trick you know it's one of those things you could see them shutting down and going this is silly and i'm so bad at this and yeah, yeah. and it's really that's a challenge right but yeah. um yeah but you guys are great yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, Newcastle. That, yeah, that was good. I enjoyed teaching up there. You know, really. Um, yeah, it was probably my first. Um, you know, Marjorie. Yeah, I, I took over from. I yeah, yeah. From, like earlier on from Marjorie. Um, then several years later, I I did the job for a few years. And, yeah, met some great students there. So um, yeah, went on to do some good things. It's like. Um, Always, I think, you know, like, uh, I was just like always been critical of the, the, the practice ethic, you know, mm -hmm. there. I felt that, yeah, you know, there could have been more, a bit more drive. Like, it's just like felt a bit like a, yeah, you know, a, uh, I don't know how you say it. Like, yeah, they just weren't practicing enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. Enough drive. But it's like, um, but yeah, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, one of them, you know, one of my students went on to have like you know, be lead in the in the I think the baby band and stuff, and did some good stuff. And oh, cool. I ran into another one of them, like who was work like actually about a year ago, who was working in Fox Studios as a sound engineer. And See? so yeah, you know, some of them got on to do some good stuff. Oh. Um, but I know there was actually at that time Richard Bella was um, he was great, and I really appreciated. Um, he was very open and honest about the situation at universities then. And I remember like, you know, my first like staff meeting and he was like, um, he just laid it out on a whiteboard about how his situation and how the funding worked and why he was like rejigging the courses, how he was, you know? Mm -hmm. And it was kind of like a, like a little bit of resistance from the, uh, you know, the more trad fields of the strings and whatever. But like, you know, I was seen as a, I, I guess as a natural ally because he's, you know, he comes from a, a quite an elect, a eclectic compositional viewpoint and had these ideas about, you know, what was what, pragmatic to teach to students. So I think, yeah, you know, yeah. apart from just my saxophone lessons, there were a lot of interesting uh, things going on in the other okay. classes and some really uh, vibrant experimentation. So it was, yeah, it was, it was great. So, yeah. And what about your, your current position now? So you're, um, uh, you've been running the, the saxophone class up there in Queensland for- uh, just, it's... just this year. Just this year, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe you can talk us through like how, what that was like, and what the sort of things that you covered in that class, and yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I tag team from from uh, Daitomi, 
uh, and um, so yeah, really, like after a full year, I finally kind of know what's going on. I think, <laughs> but you know, between like getting my head around, you know, um, yeah, the whole process of how the how the gears work, you know, and how the machine turns over for the whole year, um, combined with COVID, it was yeah, it was quite challenging, and I was yeah. Uh, probably more so for the students than me, I yeah. think, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's like, I, yeah, I, yeah, I really enjoyed, yeah, it's great. I mean, up here, there's like actually a, a pretty good work ethic, right? Like people mm -hmm. are really practicing and they kind of like, they interact and they're a really nice scene. Um, you know, first, like in terms of like what I do in the saxophone classes, um, so the first, the first semester is kind of like the first couple of, you know, a couple of years is technical work. And I, and I set that, um, and etudes as well, right? So, and in second year, they do some solo pieces, whereas the second semester is dedicated to a recital. Okay. Uh, 25, 30, 35 minutes. So, and that's basically it. And then they do chamber music. A lot of, you know, there's like a couple of sax quartets formed. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And they do, yeah, yeah, they're playing some nice stuff. So hopefully I'll get to mentor them this year. I didn't get to do that last year. So okay. I like next year, I can get to it this year. Yeah. 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 So that's, yeah, yeah. And that's great. And I'll, and teaching people at that level where they're just, you know, like they're just serious musicians and they're kind of, you know, they're really getting into it. It's like, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good for my focus and I learn a lot. So yeah, yeah. From, from teaching, you know, yeah. Mm. Right. But it's like I, I am I am actually um, constantly surprised that like, you know, because I think, um, you know, like by the time I got to the kind of like on your major scales or my minor scales and in thirds and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. But that's just not, not the case now. So like I think there's a big like in before people come, there's, you know, they go through the A and B and they really focus on their pieces by the technical work. You know, there's a lot of gaps in it. So, you know, there's yeah. a, a, a lot of filling in for that. I'm like, yeah, just making sure. I know something I got out of this year as well. Okay, I've got to actually kind of like not get too complicated too quickly. I've just got to kind of like make sure the major scale is covered and like really kind of like, yeah, work on the building blocks and go, what is essential for these students? What they need? What? Yeah. Mm. So, you know, I think I, I took a lot out of that. Okay. Yeah, that's good. And then, like later on, you know, I can get them into some more, you know, like symmetrical scales or different things. You know. Yeah. So, once once they've got those sort of uh, once fundamentals got... and things yeah, down. That, yeah, yeah, that's right. So yeah, cool. so that's cool. Yeah, that I mean, that's basically how it runs. And then, of course, there's the weekly workshops, and they're all fully combined with all the wind. Yep. And there's like it's a great. I mean, I really enjoy being a part. It's kind of a a, a really uh, close knit wind department so um you know paul dean uh, uh, basically in in charge of that and runs mm -hmm. that and he's yeah yeah that's that's really nice to, yeah to see how he kind of like creates yeah creates a community that in the atmosphere and how open he is with everyone and yeah it's yeah. good nice mm -hmm. very cool yeah. um uh, okay so moving on just to your actual teaching itself um how would you describe your uh, and this is probably a bit of a, a tricky question because it does sort of vary um, depending on the student, the level of the student and, you know, how you engage with the student. But how would you describe your sort of overall teaching philosophy? I, I could like um, probably sum it up. Um, I, I need to make myself redundant. Okay. Yeah. So however I can do that, I do it, right? Mm -hmm. So if like, yeah um yeah if, if, if i can spark people to be self-sufficient then they come in and yeah that that's superb i can just like yeah so teaching like people to learn how to learn i i think is like what intrigues me you know mm -hmm. and sort of like uh, i think lays behind uh, I, mean, it's, I guess some of what i do yeah so yeah okay. like yeah if they're doing this it's like if i if i give them this it's like kind of like so for instance right so like if they're learning a piece and i kind of teach them a way to practice it i'm like you're solving this only once you never have to solve that problem again you know, and, and, and i think that that's one of the beautiful things about learning uh improvisation or studying harmony a bit 
even if you just study harmony, you don't have to learn to improvise. But I, I learned harmony through improvising, right? Right. Synonymous process. Um, so, um, you just like look at a page and you see the patterns. So you learn things really quickly and you see the logic in it. Mm. So, you know, so I might like say like, you know, you got there. You know, I could like have pieces like we like on, on a on a page with like kind of lots of arpeggios and say what what is that what is that and it's like I like so I'm always asking questions right I like asking questions because it's the only way I can I I know like otherwise I take a whole lot of stuff for granted I reckon mm. so but yes it's all serving like yes them taking control of their own development basically. And, and like increasing their awareness of their own playing. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Um, so that brings me to my next question. You probably answered this already, um, but you know, feel free to elaborate on it. Yeah. Um, would be, you know, if you if there was one thing you wanted your students to take away from lessons with you, um, and from what I understand, uh, what you were saying, you, you would like them to, you know, have that self directed approach in what they're learning like questioning what they're doing and trying to figure out and problem solve uh for themselves essentially is that correct or well, that would that would be ideal yeah. yeah that would be good yeah 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 all right so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i i i think yeah that that's that's certainly one aspect of it right okay so yeah all right, but nice. um yeah so but i mean if you like to if they if they're going to take um yeah, one, one, yeah, one thing out. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to be curious and, and, and exploratory and not, you know, and not necessarily accept, you know, that there's one way to do things. Yeah. I find actually I have an interesting kind of, um, I always have mixed, like this is an aside, I always have mixed feelings about um, like, like listening to a recording of a piece, a recording of a piece before like playing it a lot, you know. Mm -hmm. So you get your idea of how you want to play a piece from a recording, and I and I find that like, you know, it's like reading a book, and then seeing like you know seeing a movie, then reading the book, right? Yeah, like, yeah. You can't like the characters are already being filled for you by some Hollywood exec, right? I'm not saying that, like, of course, you need to listen to the music and get an idea of what's going on. But, like, I really think it's interesting just to look at a page tabula rasa and, mm. and figure out what, what is going on here, what logic is encoded here, and then listen to it. You yeah. know, or listen to it once and then, you know, learn it and come back to it. I don't know. It's like, I, but, I mean, that comes back to kind of like, yeah, having multiple options of doing things, right? So it's, yeah. I mean, that's a particular challenge for teaching, right? Because it's like, um, you're going, oh, you know, try it this way. Oh, no, but it's like that on the recording, right? Not everyone's like that. But like, if someone's listened to it a hundred times, then that's, yeah. You know, it's it's like, um, what can you teach them about interpretation then if they've got this fixed idea of how it should be interpreted, right? Yeah. Uh, which is, I think, is, is what can happen. Um, so then all you, you know, then I guess, you know, what you can do is just sort of like, break it down just to like the um the cold logic of uh, 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 of the metronome and the tuner and more general things like tone and and you know but it's challenging i yeah, like yeah. it yeah it stimulates me so All yeah right. cool mm. um now uh moving on uh you're also um you yourself you uh you said before you know you're you're very much a very uh, a, a social butterfly on the music scene. You very much, you know, you like to hang with people, chat to people, interact with people, and you know that can lead to collaborations and things. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah. one of the things that you do um, is also you're also a very big advocate for promoting um, a, and de you know developing a saxophone community, which is evident with one of your current roles now, which is I believe you are the current president of the Queensland Clarinet and Saxophone Society. Is that? I'm oh, indeed. Yes. All right. Um, and that, that's, that's no, you know, small, um, feat that, you know, there's a lot of responsibility on that because, you know, society, you know, it, that's quite a, um, uh, the Queensland society, uh, seems to be quite one of the most active societies in the country, um, and always putting out some stuff. What are some of the projects and opportunities that, uh, that you guys provide to the community? 
Uh, well, yearly there's a competition. That's yep. probably like a, a mainstay of thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, we uh, actually we're, we're lucky that um, uh, Ben, uh, one of the uh, one of the members on the committee, works in a music shop, and, and like he's very in touch with Yamaha and Dario and, and all the sponsors. So like, and so um, on occasion when an artist comes comes through, we can offer things involved with that artist. Okay. And um, so quite often things just come up like that. Um, is something that we had, was, which was fantastic, um, that really surprised me, uh, was a clarinet choir. And there were like, you know, about 50 clarinetists showed up. This obviously wasn't this year, but it's oh, like, yeah. um, and it was re sounded remarkably good. We just like in invited like anyone above like, I think fifth grade, fourth, fifth grade. Um, yeah, and there was, again, an international artist who, you know, had his music and, um, you know, uh, was married to an opera singer who came along and sang some things as well. Um, yeah, and a couple of my students that went to that just came away going, wow, when's that happening again? I loved it. And I was like, wow, because, like, in my mind, it was just like, <laughs> like <laughs> that many clarinetists in one room was just like only getting one way. But it's yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> but, but from there, but, but from the, from the first note, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, I was a clarinet, so I was struggling, you know. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Cool. So, you know, it's, um, things like that. I mean, we've talked about um, to do with that clarinet, but there's stuff we've talked about, um, you know, maybe kind of organizing some sort of um, composition or arranging um, competition, you know, oh, yeah. to, um, to, yeah, uh, yeah, and then the winners get their pieces played right yep uh yeah or or perhaps you know like some sort of rough recording and, and a performance of it um yeah it's just how to practically make these things work it's also how to keep the money ticking over as well in a society yeah know? and it's how to um it's how to have relevance in like um you know a society i guess where schools all have their very big programs and there's a lot of competition for time so hmm. it's all challenges our last competition was pretty good. We held one despite COVID. Um, yeah, I saw it advertised the online competition. But we paired it right back. Yeah. Um, which I really enjoyed. Like um, the last, well, the, like the last few years have been, um, you know, extravaganzas, like multi room extravaganzas, like big organization. Um, but this one, this one was just like a single room, just like, two Saturdays, two Sundays in a row, right? Yep. And just, um, and live streamed it. And we only had the adjudicators in the room and the accompanist, of course, and the performer. Um, yep. And then, yeah, that was it. And we had actually had really cool prizes because um, Yamaha sponsored um, like artists, and Dario sponsored artists. I think Yamaha did actually. Okay. I don't gave a lesson to one of the winners, you know? So, cool. yeah. Um, so I thought that was a good prize, you know, like it's kind of like first prize is an online lesson with someone or a subscription to this online teaching thing. And then second mm -hmm. prize lots of reads. And so, yeah. And we had a reasonably good response to that. Yeah. Um, but it was, yeah, it was actually kind of, kind of really relaxed way to do the whole thing too. Yeah, it would be. Yeah. Um, but it's just amazing that you're able, able to still run stuff, um, particularly with all the, the difficulties with this year. So yeah, it's fantastic to still have an opportunity for people to perform somewhere, you know? Yeah. 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 It was a, yeah, it was a good thing to do. Yeah. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, I'll have to pick your brains on some stuff. Um, I'll talk to you later about it. But, All right. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, so with the society, um, it's open to anyone. So if they want to keep in a loop uh, anywhere across the country, they can just sign up and, you know, get the newsletter. Is that generally well, how it works? Well, yeah, I mean, we're pretty slack. We don't really have a newsletter. Okay. Um, we do have a website. We're talking, I mean... Yeah, I mean, we're all, we're all, the whole thing's shifting a bit to kind of talk about how to how to restructure, like, i.e., okay. how to how to be uh, relevant in today's society. You know, yeah. So we're talking about things like um, developing our own, you know, like having our YouTube channel and and you know doing things like that. Um, so probably that. I mean, we we do have a Facebook page, and that mm -hmm. like when there's events, then they will go up there. So. Yep. We're not meeting till January, so we're all like 
it smashed <laughs> after this year. So we're just like, yeah. definitely, late Jan, and we'll just have a chat about the direction of it all and see what's going on. Cool. Um, but hopefully in the future next year, there'll be a, yeah, there'll be a YouTube site, which will be a nice locus for the things. So nice. Okay. So just watch this space. Yes. Watch this space. See. Yeah. Um, cool. All right. Well, yeah, again, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we're still very much at the tail end. So I know we've gone through a lot tonight, so thank you. But yeah, That's any right. few more questions to go and then I can let you go off to bed or wherever you need to go after Yeah, I'll, I'll continue binging uh, Dark on Netflix or something, right? Oh, you do that too as well. <laughs> um, okay, now um, the, the next lot of questions, we're talking about um, the hot topic for 2020, uh, not not the US election, but COVID-19. Uh, now it's, you know, as you said before, and, you know, as I've said to all of the interviewees, um, you know, it's affected all of us and they've all said, you know, in some shape or form they've had to, adapt and you know work around all the restrictions and yeah thankfully you know here in australia we're quite fortunate that things are starting to um uh, gigs and things are starting to return emerging, yeah. yeah emerging slowly but it is coming out yeah. there but for you how like how has it impacted you personally like i know that you with your teaching you had to go online and everything like that and gigs obviously went to a standstill but what sort of things did you do or did you find that you uh, were to sort of keep you sane, I guess. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I managed to stay sane really, but I did, I think moving like definitely, um, exercise was a good one. Yep. Um, particularly after sitting at a computer all day, Yeah. Uh, it was really tiring. So yeah, I find I'd like clock off and I'd yeah, do a yoga session. I'll go for a walk or, you know, so, um, yeah. Pretty much that was it. I didn't really, um, yeah, I wasn't really practicing that much. I was sort of like folded a little bit on my creative work, apart from a few of those little things I was talking about writing before. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, watching Netflix. <laughs> it was a bit of a sabbatical, really. Yeah. You know? Just hanging out a bit you know i wasn't yeah yeah i did some yeah like i say i did an online recording with Munkle. that was interesting getting around that technology you know mm -hmm. we were to do that and that was pretty cool so yeah but um yeah nothing you know i know no silver bullet for sanity in times of COVID. yeah i think everyone's a bit like yeah that. <laughs> uh, um now, here's a bit of a, 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 a philosophical question, a bit of a deep one, but um, be curious to hear your thoughts on it. Um, uh, one thing I've started asking recently, um, particularly since you know music, live music starting to make a, a slow crawl back, um, how do you envisage the Australian music musical landscape uh, to possibly change or evolve in a post-COVID world? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, the greatest challenge is obviously for the larger institutions, right? Yeah. The, yeah, the orchestras and the, and um, yeah, I see Music of Eva's back. I'm not sure what in capacity, but they're doing things. I know Brandenburg, got to make Brandenburg. He's told me about how that's been working and all of that. Um, I don't think they're back doing no well. Mm -hmm. But I mean, like chatting to some people, um, yeah. You know, the, the programming is probably like in the larger things, probably going to be more conservative. They're going to have to conserve their funds because they've had, you know, a tough year. Yeah. And I guess with the, um, with the government being so uh, <clears throat> generous with, you know, whatever, you know, like, like going against their, their, their philosophies, they're going to be trying to claw some of that back. We know yeah. how they love the arts. Um, so I, I see, re but, you know, really vibrant, um, I think I think we were chatting about this pre uh, pre this um, about how the grassroots movement of like just people getting together and creating music. In, uh, you know, there's lots of venues in Brisbane. There's music starting to go on and well supported too. Mm. Like, you know, like lots of people out. You know, people are just like after a year of like introversion and isolation, people are keen to see live music. I think in a way they'll value it even more. So, yeah. 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 But um, yeah, I, as the challenges, I'm not really, I can't really get my head around the challenges that the larger institutions are going to face, you know, you know, not, not holding my breath for any, uh, you know, saxophone work in large ensembles. But yeah. 
yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, it is often, it's probably a bit too early to tell what the, the long-term effect is going to be for sure. But, yeah, um, that's right. yeah. I mean, I certainly hear like uh, we've uh, only just, uh, we're a little bit behind the eight ball in comparison to you guys with having audiences to our gigs. And um, yeah. uh, Nexus did a, a, a live performance with uh, an actual audience and uh, last week. And, um, you know, a lot of people came up to us and just said, you know, thank you because they just really missed um that live music experience like you know they say you know they listen to recordings and stuff on youtube or spotify or whatever or yeah. some people are really old school and even have those little shiny round things you know yeah, the, yeah. you remember those the cds and yeah you know, uh, but um Oasis. yeah 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 but um i think that uh they're certainly gonna i feel there will be a lot more appreciation for live yeah. music but whether how long that lasts and um, if all people take it for granted and just yeah yeah and then it goes back to how it was previously but yeah it's, it's an interesting one and just be I, I guess you know just sort of see how things evolve across yeah the sure and i mean i guess um you know i mean even though there's a vaccine and all of that um it's going to take a while like oh yeah i mean like take a couple of years or something right before we, like really international big artists are allowed back in properly yeah, so i'm not sure how that's working so it could work well uh, from a local perspective as well yeah so, more opportunities for local artists to do stuff, yeah which is which is happening raise, with raise the quotas on that yeah yeah which is starting to happen with some of the festivals like um because they can't get international artists they're starting to you know use more local talent and things like that so yeah so yeah. hopefully that has a lasting effect as well yeah yeah mm. um all right coming up to the last round of questions uh Oy. the final one and this is a, a very I popular one. I haven't a friend yet either. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I know. You're doing well. Um, but let's go with this one. And this is a, a nice finisher that I like to ask all the guests is, if you have only 10 minutes in a day to practice, what would it be and why? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, okay. I, I would generally do something that works as much as possible, right? So... Uh, I definitely would like to feel my embouchure, basically. Okay. Because that, I feel that that's something that is the first thing that goes, you know, and that's what, yeah, controls the sound and all of that. So, yeah. yeah. So I do, I probably do something cre like, yeah, like some sort of pro creatively based thing. Mm -hmm. uh, like, just like, just start playing, but like, have like, just kind of with a particular focus on feeling that. Really, and maybe work on my tongue as well a little, but it's um, and then just let the rest take care of itself. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah, so All then right. I'm exercising my um, yeah my creative facilities. So that's like kind of like um, a nice yeah mm -hmm. yeah All nice right. psychological meditation for ten minutes as well. So, yeah, therapeutic yeah. practice. Yeah, therapeutic practice. Yeah, yeah. nice one. Oh, with a bit of pain involved. Yeah. Well, yeah, a little, <laughs> little bit. <laughs> oh dear. All right. Well, Martin, thanks so much for joining us again this evening. Um, it was absolute pleasure. Uh, we've had a few guests come and go, but um, we've had some very positive comments. Uh, our good friend Niels from uh, Melbourne has uh, uh, passed on his uh, uh, kind uh, kind words of what a great chat and conversation it was to pick your brains on music, but. Uh, yeah, again, just like to, yeah. yeah, I know it's great. Thanks, uh, for, do, thanks for doing these things too. I, I, I it's actually I'm on. I've seen a few of them, but I, I know there's a few. I'm looking forward to going back. This is so much to be, you know, like learn and understand about people that I've hung out with for years, and then you go, wow, okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. that's that's part of the process. Like tonight there's a few things there I had no idea about you and it was this it's interesting to hear sort of where people have come from and what they've done and you know things I might not have heard or you know, things we've not chatted about. So yeah, it's great. Yeah. yeah. Um now if people want to keep in touch with you, um what's the best way to do that? Uh, and also are there any uh, are you going to be coming to Sydney anytime soon? Is there any chance oh, to see you play? I uh, yeah, no, uh, cool. there's sort of like kind of vague rumblings of, of a continuum gig. Oh, yeah. um, I haven't heard any, like, yeah, it's not been landed yet, but I'll, okay. I definitely want to come down to Sydney, you know? Like, I'm used to coming down to Sydney several times a year just for stuff, right? I know. Um, so, yeah, so I'd like to come down again. Um, yep. 
yeah, I'm sort of like looking at some specials on uh, on Jetstar. I see there's some like nice flights down in 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 February, so March. So I might like yeah, I'm like, yeah, I might kind of like consider that. Um, yeah, please do. Yeah, I'll definitely I'll definitely be down, and I'll be in touch for a hang. So yep. yeah, that'd be great. And, and just uh, yeah, like getting in touch with you. Like uh, you you've got a website that's still up and running. Or... I do. It's actually it's um. I have checked it for ages. I assume it's still up and running. Okay. I've, got, I've got one, Martin K. Sound. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, dot com. Cool. Um, awesome. Yeah, I'll I'll put a link of that in the in the YouTube when I upload. Oh uh, yeah, that that'll be cool. Yeah. So that's and, got you know that's got like yeah lots of kind of like little little snippets of, of stuff with all the, all the bands we've talked about tonight. And, cool. Uh, cool. Yeah. 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 Great. Uh, all right, well, we'll do. But yeah, again, thanks again, and uh, thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we have our final Q and A in two days' time. I've managed to squeeze in two this week because um, I'm a sucker for punishment. But our, our final guest for 2020 is none other than uh, one of my esteemed colleagues and um, co-conspirators of Nexus, uh, Andrew Smith. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, he's got a lot of a lot of things to share, and um, yeah, they'll be happening this Thursday at 8 p.m. Australian Eastern Standard Time, and that will be the last Q&A that we have for 2020. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it should be great. But, again, thanks again, Martin, and thanks, everyone, for tuning in, and we will see you in a couple of days' time. Thank you. That is great to hang, great to chat. Thanks for listening, everyone, wherever it is out there. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Catch up soon. All right. See you. All right. Ciao. Ciao.